You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. What's that seem you say you get rooms for that money? Like how much money was counted out at some stages? Hundreds of millions. Do I miss the lifestyle? I'd, I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss the lifestyle to elements. I was looking at trying to earn millions rather than anything else, just to keep me going on the run. There was no, uh, there was no big kitty in the background uh, supporting me. I had enough to get the private plane and all the stuff that I needed and all that, but not enough to, to live the rest of my life. But the gear that I was actually caught with, believe it or not, came back as 91% pure cocaine. So there wasn't really a stigma in my corner as far as, oh, I've been bringing poisons or toxins in. You're making them hundreds of millions of pounds every single year. You are their golden child, do you know what I mean? They're going to wrap you in cotton wool, believe me. They don't want to lose you. I've seen a bloke called Dr. Death strangled to death in front of myself. You know, by other lads who, who was in trouble with the black gangs, ran into a cell and just grabbed the oldest person they could. So, you know, so they could stay in prison a bit longer, you know. Yeah. You know, drug people in Mexico that have put cuts in there, stuff that they put in tyres, it's yeah. cancerous, and people are putting yeah. cancer straight up into nose. their brain, up right nose. up your nose into your brain. It's called a commercial system. Forcing every day that you was born, you've been forced to say, we need to have that, we need to do this, yeah, right. we need to drink this, we need to eat that, we need to kill animals and we need to eat them. We need to do everything that the commercial massive industry yeah. tells us that's what we want to do. The, the truth of the matter is, if I'm honest, tomorrow morning if I probably want to go back to Boom, we're on. We've got a treat for everybody today, man. That three men, top of their craft, former drug smugglers, Steve and me, spent over 20 years in prison, working in Europe. Andrew Pritchard, the man himself, allegedly shipping thousands from Jamaica each month. And then we've got Sydney, pilot, pilot shipping, his, shipping yeah. his own gear from Europe back into Britain again. Everyone he's served over 20 years. Mad stories. I've had three on the podcast before. Highly respect for three of you, man. That... First and foremost, how are we, guys? Yeah, good. Well, good. Yeah, it's journey. surviving, you know, it is. <laughs> the coppers would have had a hard on if this table was sitting like this 10, you 20 imagine? years ago. Yeah, there'd have been, yeah. there'd been something oh. going on, wouldn't there? <laughs> 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 would have been coming through the door, mate. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they would have been doing. I think the word conspiracy might pop up somewhere in the in their conversation <laughs> as well, yeah. We were just talking about that, funny enough. Yeah. Did you, did you know, did, when you were all involved, did you know each other? Or did you see each no, other? No, no, not really. Obviously, some people, you know, you, you, you few mutual friends, you know people. But I could say we'd never worked with Stephen or Sydney before. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. I met Steve uh, when we were doing time in um, a place called Loudon Grange, Nottingham Prison. Um, we weren't great mates, but we, we knew each other, say hello to and out and a bit of respect there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but there you are, that was a while ago, and thank goodness that's all over, you know. Yeah. See when you were in prison back in the day, if you heard somebody was doing big bits of graft, would you try and get an in with them or were you just thinking, leave them alone and do your own thing? Bits of graft were in jail? Yeah. No, if you knew no, something yeah, was Yeah, doing, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, sorry Steve, you've got to talk on. Yeah, no, no, just not while you're in jail. Mm -hmm. It's suicidal, isn't it? You know, anybody's talking on them phones in jail, they fucking die. Yeah. The police are just sat there listening to them. I'll tell you what, right, Steve, yeah. what Steve says, he's dead right. Well, I went out once from Loudon Grange to go to a hospital. I had a throat problem. 
And um, the first thing I noticed when I got out the gate was a big te telephone beacon on the hill next to the neck. Now, and I told everyone, right, as a lot of people already knew, but still they took no notice. No. One guy on my wing was shipping a, a ton of uh, coke. You'll remember this, Steve. I can't remember his name. But they'd done an undercover operation basically based on telephone calls that were going from yeah, now From the jail, wasn't it? Yeah, I remember. Uh, well, yeah. I can't remember his name. I can't. It'll come to me shortly. He uh, got another 20. Yeah. He was just finishing a 20-year sentence, and he knew about the beacons. I told him, right, and he still went ahead with it and got another 20 years. Are you allowed to get surveillance while in prison? Oh, they, they surveil. If you get a bit yeah. of nick like Loudon Grange where you've got people like us in there, they will listen to your calls. Don't yeah. worry about that. Did you know that? Yeah, of course. They've got their own uh, thing. They've got their own beacon. Just yeah. just for, for the prison. Nobody else uh, uses a telephone around there. And when they when anybody does, it just goes straight to that beacon and it yeah. just transfers mm -hmm. back to the police. You just sat there listening. Freeze, I try to kind of live a normal life now. Like, yeah. How are you dealing with it, Andrew? Well, it's what people don't understand. It's the lifestyle you miss. And uh, it's very easy, you know, to misconcept that, mm. to the lifestyle to actually the business um you know and the lifestyle at times you do think you know wow it's a big difference but the reality of it is once you're able to understand that you can create a business a legitimate business and take those transferable skills you had in the other game yeah. and utilize it your lifestyle will come after that and that's a very very important thing to do which yeah. most people they're reliant on what they've done before which got them into prison but you know it's einstein's definition of madness <laughs> you know you can't do the same thing over and over again expect a different result so yeah. if you're going to come out of prison after serving a lengthy sentence and adapt back to the same thing you got you in in the first place it is madness, you know. So, do I miss the lifestyle? I I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss the lifestyle to elements. Do I miss yeah. the police kicking in my door? Do I miss, you no. know, being followed around the world with surveillance by <laughs> DEA in a pole and all the other agencies? No. Do I miss, you know, going to prison and being away from my kids and my family? Do I miss destroying thousands of people's lives? Nah, not one little bit, James. Mm -hmm. What about the pilot? What's that buzz when you're up in that air? And yeah, the, the side of it, I mean, like now I live a, a totally normal life. I mean, the highlight of my day is going out and getting a bit of shopping or going to the gym for a workout, <laughs> right? The only thing I miss about being involved in smuggling was just what you'd call the edge, where you're on the edge and it's obviously exciting because it can all fall down or you make a lot of money. That edge is what you miss, I think, more than anything. Mm hmm um, like Andrew said, you obviously don't miss the door being kicked in at three in the morning. You don't miss being dragged. To, obviously, it goes without saying. You know, it's, that's all horrible. But the edge while you're out and you are involved is addictive, I would say. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I miss it to a degree today. Not that I'm going to get it back involved again. I'm too old. But I miss that edge that, that you're on, you know. What about you, Stephen? What do you miss the most? I don't miss any of it. I like my life as it is now. Mm -hmm. yeah, nice and relaxed, you, Steve. nice and peaceful, like he says, Sid. Yeah. Nobody kicking your door in or having to look behind your back and all the shite involved. People don't realise the, the depths of uh, despair that you can put yourself into in the middle of, like like for me, especially in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Columbia. Or, you know, if somebody comes through your door there, nobody's there to help you. You're finished, aren't you, really? Yeah. So, no, I don't miss any of that. It was nice, you know, with nice big yachts and all the, Fancy planes and shite, really. It's all sparkly See, stuff. When you, when you look back <laughs> on stuff. Now, as bad as it all is, is what we're saying, what the, the, the downside of it is, if you were a postman, and I'm not knocking postman, or you worked in Tesco stacking shelves, you would never have the stories to tell later no. on once you've been through all the shit, isn't it, Andrew? Yeah. Once you've been through it, it's a lot easier for us to sit here now and say that was exciting, that was good or whatever, and that was bad. Mm -hmm. But if you, you led a straight existence, you wouldn't even be sitting here, would you? Yeah, you're very true. But, you know, it's one of those ones. You said everyone's had their life experience and uh, it's a journey you, you, you go on. Yeah. You know, as I said, what gets people involved in the first place? And you have to turn. We asked me this question, I remember, at the end of the first podcast we done together and you said to me, you know, do you regret it? And 
regret some of it. You regret going to prison. But if I didn't go to prison and if you didn't get caught, you mm. wouldn't actually hopefully change your life, you know, yeah. because you yeah. will continue going. And, yeah, you know, in that game, you know, mm -hmm. and my uncle always told me something. He said, remember, he said, uh, stop it ain't the same as being stopped. Yeah. And that's a big difference, you yeah. know, and young people get involved in this game because they see, you know, the glamour and, you know, it's, it's a very attractive life on the yeah, face of it. Uh, thin, though, but it? When you go beneath it, you'll realise it isn't such a great life because you find yourself around a lot of people, more people you can shake a stick at, you know, and they're there, not as friends, really. They, you know, you, you get the element of friendship, but it becomes business associates. And when you find yourself in a world that every single person you're based around is an associate, Link to that business, there's no yeah. friendship, it's associates. Okay, so you're going to grow your family and everything you start to base your life on is based on that lifestyle. That's the addiction. Okay, and the addiction is it's all you get to know, and it's quite sad because when you get to a certain stage in your life, you could have spent 20, 30 years on the <coughs> road, and it's very hard for people to turn back. And I see yeah. it, you've seen it yourself, Steve, in prison. You know, there are people there, and I just know how hard it is for some of them because you know, they're gonna come out of prison, you know, in your 50s. And as you know, nothing else. Yeah. I was lucky, you know, because I had had I had a full life as a concert promoter, and I've had some very successful businesses and quite an eventful life in many things, James. So, by the skin of my chinny chin chin, I was able to come and set up a charity, put respectable people as trustees on the board, because otherwise it would never been taken seriously. The police would never give me a chance in hell. Wouldn't have contracts with Serco or Westminster Council. They wouldn't touch a ten foot barge pole. But because of the opportunity I had before I was very fortunate I could draw on some of those people but for someone who's never had the opportunity you know how do you come out of prison at an age and then say start again very hard you know I think it's nearly impossible at the moment it's hard Steve yeah, you know yeah. the people who are getting out now are going to really suffer you know what, what have they got a lot to, to look forward to nothing yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's funny enough, you mentioned a company there you do business with, Serco. Serco, yeah. <laughs> Serco ran uh, the Martin Grange. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Serco's what the yeah. Latin Grange one of the prisons they had, yeah. 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 They just lost it recently. To, uh, I think it's uh, Cerdix or G4X got it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's still yeah. private. Still private. Yeah, prison, yeah, 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 yeah. Every one of you's got a life sentence. Was there was any time you'd, you would think to yourself you would never get caught? Or did you always think? I, I always thought there was a possibility in the background. I I'd never deceived myself with, with any of that. I always knew that what we was doing was so high, high profile. It applies to all of us here. That you, you've got to think that you're going to get caught sooner or later. But you're always trying to stop before you get caught. But because there's getting caught and, and giving up. It's not the same and, thing. Yeah. It's not the same thing. Yeah. It's true. You do feel that way. Yeah. I remember when I walked away from that half a ton case in 2006. Yeah. You know, you felt invincible, you know. You know, in your mind, you tell yourself anything you can beat, but you got to realise, you know, when you perhaps get away, you don't go with something, but if you do something in the eyes of the law enforcement, they will come back for you. And if you're stupid enough to keep going back, you know, you're going to get caught. There's no two questions or ways about it. And when you do get caught, you know, you're not going to get a slap on the wrist. They're going to give it to you good because... You know, it's something that you're yeah, paying. if you've you're, walked before, yeah. You're paying for what you've done. Yeah. That's yeah. the reality of it. So yeah. there's no such thing as, you know, getting a lucky break. And or, you're up against a very big organisation, aren't you? Let's be honest. No matter, no matter how clever you think you are or whatever, they've got forces, forces, legions of people to police. With the, with the, I told, I remember telling you once, the, uh, the eight, eight GCHQ down at Cheltenham, 20 billion they spent on the building and the machinery and equipment in there, and all listening in to stuff and that, 20 billion. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you, you are up against it severely. How much surveillance did you have on you, Sydney? Did you, would you, was it just... I had none at all. I'll tell you what, one of the most amazing things, like when I told you about the time when I, I pulled the plane, landed the plane in South End, and I got chased by the customs, I got away and then obviously had to land, right? About 20 minutes later, in pitch black, right? I landed the plane, they swamped the plane. When they let me out of the airport, which was about 11 at night, all I could see for about half a mile was police vans and dog vans and police cars where they were searching the area for something that I may have dropped, right? 
And yet when I got up in the morning at six o'clock in the morning, I jumped on my Yamaha, went out in the wilds to see if I was drawing any attention and they weren't even on me. They just didn't have time to set up a surveillance. <clears throat> they got on me about, I must have been about three months later, but it was so obvious. I mean, I, you know, I'm driving around and I'd, I'd go out my way to deliberate places and I'd see them, you know, they were easy to check. But these days now, they don't even have to do that. They could put a tracker in the car and sit at the station like that with a cup of coffee, watching where you're going. So, you know, you really are up against it, mate. And if you think just because no, when you walk out in the morning, no one's on you, you drive your car to various remote places just to check, see if you've got anyone on you, they don't have to do that now. If you're in the game are, are, now... Are, you're still not doing that, Sid. What's that? Driving up all <laughs> over the place. I do, I've had a bit of I wake up and yeah. wonder where yeah. I am, you know. But, yeah. um, no, you really are up against yeah. it. And as I say, these days, they'll just put a bug in your car. I mean, they bugged my flat, and the only way that I found out my flat was bugged, I ordered Sky TV to put that on. And I went back in the afternoon, and the engineer was there doing it. And we said, hey, mate, said, I'm not being rude or personal, but are you some type of criminal or something? I went, why? He said, I'm telling you now, your flat's been bugged. He went, look, and he drew the wires from the phone and went through it with bedroom and everything. <clears throat> this was about 20 years ago. So that was what they were doing then. These days now, they don't need to attach to wires and that. Mm -hmm. They can replace remote bugs that just send a signal out like your mobile phone and they listen yeah. to everything. Yeah. See, when you were in Jamaica, Andrew, like, was there no surveillance on you there because a different place or was there still, were you still hot over there? Show, right, so it'll make you laugh. When I was obviously based here, I at least spent a lot of money on counter surveillance equipment, you know? And obviously we used to have bent old booster perf as well to get the heads up on things. But um, if I remember, one of the funniest things I remember in Jamaica, I was out there and uh, I was with my mentor, basically, and uh, we had a, we were sitting, we were having a meet, discussing some stuff, we were, you know, literally on a deserted beach, you know, sitting there at the table, whatever, and a bird flies, and it flies, and the thing just stops and lands at the table. And a mid-conversation, everyone, boom. And I'm talking... And everyone's stone face like that, completely fucking ignoring me. And I'm thinking, um, he's looking at me, not a word said, not a word, not a word. For four minutes, I'm thinking, what the fuck have I done? As soon as the bird flies off, they go back to normal conversation. I'm like, what was that? They go, listen, let me tell you something. The DEA can put together anything, right? That could have been a mechanical device that's come there and listened to us. Do you think our voice is going to be a voice recognition? Or worse than that, we're going to start talking about deals. And I thought to myself, well, this was over 25 years ago. And I thought to myself, that's so far-fetched, ain't even funny. But when you see counterterrorism and you see how they operate, and that's exactly what they use. They now, use insects, this is they? the stuff that they can have insects, yeah, right, with listening and recording devices. So it'd be stupid to think that this technology existed, you know. We used to have been, you know, police and surveillance people and stuff like that, James. And I remember getting a heads up from a long time ago. All the phones we used to have, you know, we could be sitting out, you buy a phone, you know, the four phones are out there, brand new. They drive by every couple of seconds, these have a signal which goes to the antenna, right? They grab the, 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 they grab the, uh, the signal, right? They sit literally just waiting for you to get on the phone. They got all that some voice recognition. So if you thought you bought a brand new phone, two minutes later, yeah. they got your number. Yeah. So that's just a very basic bit of technology. Some yeah. of the technology they have actually got, he's talking about trackers, they're so dated, they go straight into the computer of the car now. Do you know what I mean? It's done straight away yeah. from it. It's, yeah. it, it's all this. Well, it's, it's, the yeah. technology. And I remember these things. Used to have big ears because I'd done sound engineering, so I knew had a good heads up on a lot of this stuff. They got a thing called a big ears microphone, and it sends a signal, right? So you're sitting in a room talking, and what it does is your voice gives off sound waves, so the actual the the the, the glass, the, yeah. the glass yeah, vibrates. So you yeah. put a vibrator onto the glass, literally, right? No. And have that switched on when you're sitting and talking. Because what if, if they did have that piece of equipment, yeah. they couldn't make out what the fuck was being said. Mm -hmm. But so what they used, sorry about it, they, they used a laser mm. on the glass that was that accurate, the laser, 
But it's, as we're talking now, sound that waves. glass is slightly vibrating. Reach sound waves. Yeah, yeah. reach sound waves. That's what mm. I said, the vibrating important thing. So all these kind of Amazing. things. And the technology they got now, you know, you couldn't even dream it back. Because the stuff that they get come is passed down from MI5 and the I6. So they get the stuff like 10 years after. So we know about the stuff they've got now, potentially some of it. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that is out there and exists out there, believe me, it's, it's you know, it's yeah. a different class. You've got 23rd yeah. century, isn't it? it is. You go back yeah. to the 70s, you see the mafia using outside phones. But this day and age as well, you've got kids Primitive. basically sticking themselves in like, it's crazy that like, the technology like you were saying now and even John Gotti when he used to walk outside his club I saw this on a on a on a documentary he'd walk down to the corner and think he was safe all they did the lampposts on the corner they put a, a, a buzz a bug in it because <laughs> he walked to the same lamppost mm -hmm. every time you know so see your paranoia so obviously you're not safe settings. anywhere you were obviously free doing your thing but you had a life you had a life sentence hanging over in your head was that then easier just yeah, to put everything I didn't have a life sentence were you not they wanted though. Thirty years. Yeah. yeah you were wanted. Good, that's as good yeah. as life. Yeah. Not life yeah. <laughs> but close enough. Yeah, you were wanted. So yeah. does that make it easier on the run and just going full steam ahead? Or are you more careful? More careful. Mm -hmm. In 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 the three year period that I lived in Holland, I, I rented thirteen houses. Anybody looked at me one fucking for one second and I was gone, I left everything behind. I just changed house in, in split seconds, really. Walking down the main street in in, in like Sassenheim where we had the the big house, somebody looked at me the wrong way there, and I just was mm -hmm. it. Like, where's the next house going to be? Paranoid all the time. See, it's worse when you're on the run because yeah. you you know that as soon as you get you you're finished anyway. But you knew you were going to get a big sentence if you get caught. I'd already got a big sentence. Yeah, the sentence I was doing twenty two, do <sighs> and then I was out on the street. Mm -hmm. Expecting but, even more. Well, not more because I knew I was operating from Holland. Was so it, the sentence is a lot lesser. So, see, when you know you're getting 22 years if you're getting caught, was there ever a time for you just moving away, stopping, and trying changing? No, because I needed money. You know, I escaped. To, I had a few pounds here and there, but nothing to keep me going while I was on the run. I was looking at trying to earn millions rather than anything else, just to keep me going on the run. There was no, uh, there was no big. Kitty in the background uh, supporting me. I had enough to get the private plane and all the stuff that I needed and all that, but not enough to, to live the rest of my life. Yeah, that's what Andrew was saying. There's, it's never enough until you never get enough. caught. Never yeah. enough. It's a, it's a it's, you can't describe it's like Dracula. It's a never ending quest for not blood, but for money, yeah. you know, and you can't describe it. And what it is, the more you get, the less important it becomes is but back to the achievement of getting it more and more and more to the degree, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, you, you can't stop. It's like an addiction. That's why I'm saying that drug smuggling is the greatest addiction, not drug taking. You know, yeah. people are in a very bad state as addicts, I mean, you know, you have to accept we're part of that, you know, chain of causing that death and destruction. But as a smuggler, as a retired smuggler, I know the addiction that is to the to that buzz. As Sydney said, it's a buzz that you drive from. But people don't realise the reality. One of the biggest things that shocked me in two thousand and eight. The uh, DEA um, release of a thing that's called a global report, and they put what are threats to their, um, you know, to, 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 to national threats to security of America and all that. I got personally named in that, and um, I've read up on something after that, James, that soccer, which was this, you know, serious, uh, the old, they used to be the NCAA, yeah, they moved across to it, right? Yeah. They contribute to that document, and what they actually done was, and this is what scared the life out of me. The Americans basically had, if you travelled into a country like Pakistan, which which luckily I never went now, and because I, I, I didn't do heroin, but if you travelled into a region which is classified as a terrorist, um, you know, location, it. the Americans had an instruction to take you out of the fucking drone. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about not terrorism. Here we're talking about you're yeah. smuggling drugs, and you've got a green light by the Americans. If you travel to that country, to be taken out as a threat to national security. So you're talking about a death sentence, yeah. and th these are serious games there. I heard about that. You too. know, and these games there, I was playing every day. You know, and then the reality of it is, you don't really the, sh the aftershock don't come until, as you say, it's like an alcoholic will have a moment of what they call clarity. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that moment of clarity comes to you perhaps when you're sitting in a cell and you're reflecting back and you think, 
forget the people that probably wanted to kill you along the way to get you out of the game. You're talking about the actual government themselves put price on your head. Is it really worth it? Yeah, but like you say, it's trying to stop unless you end up getting caught yourself. What was the biggest buzz for you, Andrew? Was it the meetings, organising the graft? Or was it getting the graft through customs? Or was it getting the money? Like, what was the one that you got you more excited? It's a combination of things. Logistics was always the thing. It was about beating the system. Because, you know, I've always been a business person and always looked for how you can, you know, do things, okay, the most effective way. So... It wasn't a question of finding one route. Obviously, we worked with perishable goods, could have a click to clear. You know, I didn't work with small aircraft. I used, with passenger, you know, I used passenger couriers and stuff. And we done everything that was possible to put, you know, drugs in the top of a plane. You know, I mean, we put them behind panels in the doors where we had, you know, engineers go on there and take stuff off after the planes arrived. You even had bins we used to load where the rubbish used to go. And they'd take them off and do them in the nose of the plane we put gear. You know, and then it couldn't get enough gear in there. So we worked down at the bottom of the plane and done it all in the cargo. And it was a question, every part of that plane you could possibly imagine, we had people who would get it off. I remember one day we had a plane, British Airways coming to Jamaica and because there was so much going on, they used to leave the cabin crew on there. So they'd have to stay on the plane until the other cabin crew arrives. And we thought, we've got to get this parcel home. And then said, the only way you're going to do it, we're going to have to pull a switch, basically, on the electrics on the plane, right? And then that way they've got to come off, engineers got to go on. And I thought, let's get it right. We're talking about 350 passengers and we're going to fuck about with electrics on an aeroplane now, right? <laughs> that goes down in the middle of the... Do you know what I'm saying now? Yeah. Oh, and I serious, thought, yeah. what kind of madness is that? And this was the yeah. kind of stuff that, you know, we were doing. And this was the kind of stuff yeah. I enjoyed doing. You know, you know, we circumvented every kind of shipping container there was. You know, we've every source and thing known to man, you know what I mean? I think we've probably smuggled through, you know, and that was the buzz. Do you know what I mean? It was getting the go fast boats with the, you know, the, 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 the four, two fifty Yamaha engines on the back and taking the runs from Honduras down into the coast of St. Elizabeth. Do you know what I mean? It was the mad things of getting them back on a container here, do you know what I mean? And sending them across half a ton, ton of coke on it. Do you know what I mean? Allegedly. Do you know what I mean? That was the buzz of getting it done. And you know the budget, of course, <laughs> of having the money was 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 another big thing. What you bought with the money and mm. being able to make you know invest in big things. But the reality of it is, it was hard longer in that type of it, cash flow. Um, well, it, it must it, have been. People think it is, it isn't because if you order that kind of money out in the Caribbean and places like that, people are happy to take huge oh, amounts right. of money yeah, and oh, they're happy uh, to put up six hundred houses or they're happy to you yeah, know like invest in, 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 in mining. They're happy mm. to invest in things of that level. Back here, there's a certain amount of things you can have and naturally show. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Otherwise, you're going to get that. nicked. There's no yeah. question of that about it. But how much money does one human being want? And it's all good having the money, but unless you're actually doing something constructive with it, James, that's a legacy. And you can never have a legacy doing drugs, believe me. You can't have a legacy, right? It amounts to nothing. You can leave nothing really behind that yeah. says, I was here, I made a difference in this world. We're going to be the biggest drug smuggler who's responsible for getting 20,000 kids wanting to be like you, that will half of them get killed, half of them get themselves in prison, all the death, destruction, misery that that's caused. That's not my legacy. That wouldn't be my legacy. Do you know what I mean? You know? Mm. Why, do you think, now, yeah, why do you think that these conversations and drug smugglers are so popular that like, people love these conversations? Like, it's it, not about glorifying, it's but it's... It's flirting with and danger. Yeah. It's, they, Look, people, the public love to flirt on the edge of like to what people like us talk about because it's out of their out of their periphery, it's out of their norm, you know. They're going to work every day earning a straight wage or whatever. They're not going to want to listen to a story about a bloke who works in a bank or whatever. Mm -hmm. They want to listen to stories of people like us. How do you learn how to trust Stephen in that life? Like, is, <sighs> it, is every relationship kind of broken down or does it get what you can and then move on to the next? Like, what is it? I don't yeah, imagine become yeah. lonely. When, when you're working with different gangs from different countries, then it's just pure business. There's no uh, relationship, really. It's not even uh, associates. They, they, they're just traders. It, it's like working on a market and you're just trying to sell something to somebody and buy something off somebody else. You know, it's, it's uh, there's no trust there. How much? Trust within your, your, yeah. your own circle, but even that becomes dangerous after a bit when the money starts getting up into the millions. Does it oh, start? That? See, when you go to like Colombia and stuff, is that in that mainframe? Like, that takes a lot of bottle. 
as well. Like for the average man, they would think it's all well and good that every man thinks they're tough and thinks they can sit at a table and talk to anybody. But then you you say the wrong thing, you make the wrong move, you're dead. Like, are you just going in there calm or is it always at the back of your mind that you might never walk out that room again? No, I don't think you... I, I never thought that I was was never going to walk out of certain rooms and, and certain conversations. You, you just know that if you go in there with the right information and you're standing in a good position, you, you're not fucking snide from somewhere. And wherever they look, they can check you up and find out who you are, where you come from and what you've done. Then, no, I, don't, I, I never thought that I was going to die coming going into a meeting. started on that one occasion when I went into that big meeting where nobody knew where all the drugs was or where they'd gone. But I didn't go in there thinking I'm, I'm not coming out of there. Halfway through it, I did. Once yeah. the question started coming to me, but no, no, I just, I don't know. It's strange. You, you just get on with it. Yeah. It becomes part of your life. It's like you now doing what you're doing. You don't think about it, do you? You just do yeah. it. I know. It's true. I think the mad thing as well, people have a misconception of that. You know, it, cartels and, but you know, I thought you were like using the word cartels and business associates, hmm. but your business associates abroad wrap you in cotton wool. Because you got to understand, you know, narcotics up there is, you know, it's very, it's, it, there's no much value to it. Basically, it can't be sold, no. you know, locally. It's got to be sold abroad. And you're yeah. talking about Europe. Britain is a prime location, you know, Australia, high levels of obviously money. But you're talking about, for them people to have a contact that can actually clear goods, you know, lots of products. You're making them hundreds of millions of pounds every single year. You are their golden child. Do you know what I mean? They're going to wrap you in cotton. Well, believe me, they don't want to lose you. The only problem you may have is someone else is a bat, mm. okay, who they're going to get a better deal from, and that can come in the way of a different crew or a different organisation. Then you're you're in. You could be easily gone. Believe me, that can happen so easily. But you know, if you're doing business as Stephen said, and you're playing straight, because you have to play straight, otherwise you will not be alive. Believe me. You know, you will be wrapped in cotton wool, but where it will go wrong, as I said, eventually is when you start having losses and, yeah. you know, people are very stupid because when you start to lose stuff, you're not losing it because you're unlucky. You're losing it because the police are taking it, they're discovering it and letting you continue because they're waiting for everyone to get on the phones, which is what you do. So if something goes down, you got this, you've seen this, you've seen this, and they say the conspiracy is <coughs> built up and they take years, they'll let you move a hundred, they'll lose you, they'll keep going, keep going, keep going. And everyone's so stupid, you just think, oh, I'm lucky I lost that again. They're catching it. They're listening to the phones. After effect, the ripple effect, who supplied it, who's doing it. And that's what happens, you know. There's no such thing as a coincidence, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. And How much pull have the cartels got abroad? Like, would they send people to the UK and, and take lives? Or is that a bit far-fetched <laughs> like the films? No, like, fuck is it? You know, I know people, <laughs> I, know 100, I know several occasions where, you know, cartels, certainly what I describe as organisations, have sent people over, you know, with babysat them and they've done what they've had to do and gone back, you know. And as I said, that's that's a very common practice. It happens a lot, particularly with the Caribbean cartels, you know, the Jamaican and things like that, because, you know, it, there's guys that have racked up 150 murders. I mean, they're the biggest serial killers in the whole of, yeah. do you know what I mean? It, it, known a man, do you know what I mean? If you ask him, well, how many people you kill? One particular guy said, well, well, I don't count bodies when you're spraying an Uzi down an alley. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So life means nothing. And as I said, you know, it's like anything can happen. But some things are misconstrued. Some things are over-exaggerated, you know, and films do that. But you never, ever forget the danger that you're in every single day, mm -hmm. you know. And I've seen it, you know, I've seen many times... I would have been at places, could have been at places, and people have been rubbed out. Two, three, you know, two, three people rubbed out, one hit. You know, had I been there, would have been there as a yeah. casualty of war, <laughs> yeah. do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, that's the very age, lucky. Yeah, 2022, like, how hard would it be now if Sydney says, you know what, I've got the plane there, you've got a contact in Jamaica, you've got a contact in Columbia, like, how hard would it be to fill that plane and bring it back? Has things changed that much or is it still... Do you know what? There's yeah, a slight possibility. Of in a private plane, to be honest with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Most first... private planes don't even got that range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, first of all, the, the truth of the matter is, if I'm honest, tomorrow morning, if I probably wanted to go back to doing it, I could. But I wouldn't. For biggest reason, my conscience wouldn't allow me to do it. People who I generally love and generally love me, I wouldn't put them through it. 
you know. I'm a very lucky man, James. I've come out of prison and, you know, I've been given a second chance. Mm. I've walked into the third sector, which is, you know, people can't go in there. I mean, tough business people can't survive in, you know, and create charities and be trusted by, you know, government organisations, for fuck's sake. You know mm. what happened the other week? And I'll tell you a very quick story. I was invited to a knife crime um, uh, convention at the Old Bailey courtroom one. And I went there and um, I noticed the guy that was sitting at the judge, he was overlooking it. You know, it was like an out of hours thing. You had a surgeon on there, trauma surgeon, a poor woman whose son had been murdered. And uh, the judge was looking at me and I thought, well, I recognise him, I don't know where from. When they've then gone at the end of it, they've gone, I would like to say, I won't say his name, but We'd like to thank blah, blah. He was, he was once since 15 years and I couldn't believe it. So I'd done it again where the kids was all up in the, um, the, the, uh, the gallery, basically, you know, where the witness box, where the, um, uh, jury box was. I've walked through there, gone up to his bench and I've given my card and he's like, uh, he's like, oh, thank you. Thinking I'm someone from the thing. I've gone, you don't remember the other. You, know, you, you give me 15 years. He was in shock. But really, if it was, I was in that space, whereas I could never have been there. I would have been spitting yeah. in his face, doing all that stuff. And a man's even invited me to go and speak at the judges' convention. Yeah. People like us ain't supposed to be around judges. Well, you know knowing, I mean? knowing that you did, he did give you 15 he years. Apologized he apologised for giving me 15 years. Did he really? Why? Well, hey, that's what I said to him. I said, was you weren't so sorry for giving it to me. You know what he said to me? The powers that be. Okay, the powers that be. And that's what it is. When you create enough havoc and you put yourself so far in their face, yeah, you're going to get paid, trust me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's from a judge's math, you know? Yeah. So I feel honoured, I feel privileged to know I can, at the end of the day, say to myself, you know what? These people have realised I have changed now. Do you know what I mean? Because never in a million years you'd be invited to talk at a judge's training convention. Yeah. They keep us so far away from judges. Once that's once that happens, that's it. You know it's game over, mm -hmm. you know? So at the end of the day, listen, anything can happen. Maybe might can change. Yeah, we're talking about change. Like, how hard does it to change, though, Stephen? Like, doing big sentences and having that back in the day to coming out, like, how difficult it is to go, do you know what, I'm going to knuckle down and, and give life a good go? It's very hard. It's nearly... A, when I got out, I had a... A bit of a start because I had all my paintings. Uh, I came out with, with 50, 60 paintings finished, ready for sale. And I was lucky that I got decent money. But without that and without a strong family base, I think I would have been back inside. I, I even think at the moment, like you were saying there, I don't think they think I'm finished nah. for some reason because of what's been happening with my probation. You know, asking me questions, won't let me travel, telling me not to come and do these things, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. Mm. Why, why are they still yeah, on my I'm case at this ratings. time? Mm -hmm. It's because my ex-partner's just got out and stuff like that. I don't know. But I, I've never felt like the, 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 the systems sort of thought that yeah. I'm, I'm finished. I'll tell you just an yeah. example of, of what you're saying, Steve. Um, my my licence ends up in February. And, yeah, mine uh, is the same. I put, in, I put in for a passport about two months ago. You won't believe the hoops I've had to jump through, right? Oh, we won't accept that. Five different people had to identify me with the, you know, your picture and say that it was me when they know it was me anyway, right? They literally put everything in the way and I finally got the passport about a week ago. Oh, right. After three months of wrangling and, and, and fighting for See, it. See, they're, they're proofing the thing here. Mm -hmm. I, I had the National Geographic Company saying that they'd give me uh, give probation everything where we was going to go what we was going to do who we was going to be with who we was going to talk to and they still top fuck off when do you think do you think they'll ever leave you alone uh or are you always going yeah, to have well, that yeah well they'll leave me alone when i disappear when i get my fucking passport back mm -hmm. i think so, your name's earmarked at the home yeah. office and if, it, if you've got that asterisk over your name right i i think it's, it's there forever mate you're not yeah. going to move that When's the dark Even times if they think there? you're finished with everything, uh -huh. they still, they're, they're still there. When's the dark times really hit? Like, if you, was it Miss Jamaica you were with and you're making a lot of money like, and then you end up in prison? Like, when does it hit you? Is it years down the line or is it first night in the cells? Like, when do you go, what the fuck has just happened? The reality is this. Look, it is an occupational hazard, okay? If you're in the game, you've got to be prepared that you may fall down at some point. 
when the reality hits you, it don't hit you in your 20s or your 30s. It hits you when you go past your 40s. Because what it does is you then realise there's things you should be doing in your life when you're sitting in a prison cell. Yeah. And prison, especially the spiritual system, ain't no place for a geezer who's 50 years old or 45 years old or 60 years old. It's all young boys in there doing 40-year wrecks, you yeah. know, postcode yeah. gang kids. Kids are there on the road every single day. Do you want to be around all that madness and all that noise? That's when you realise suddenly... The guy that's probably got his wife, he's got his children around him, you know, he's got a little bit of money, he goes on his two holidays a year, is actually, at that moment in time, having a far, well, he is having a far greater life than you, and you're sitting there for 10 years. Yeah. While he's there, the comfort of his own ass, yeah. right, with his kids around, enjoying his grandchildren, that's when the rally hits you. Another big rally hits you is when you actually accept it you've done a lot of destruction and devastation to people. Because we accept, oh, I feel so bad because my missus is at home, my kids are at home, which is terrible for them and your parents aging, all that stuff. But the day you accept that what you've done has destroyed thousands of families, yeah, it's, but, the, it's, 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 it's done Andrew, stuff. Well, well, I can say the same about Johnny Walker Whiskey. I've got no, to be honest with you, I know exactly the point you're making, right? I just disagree because life... There's, there's toxins and, and, and things that upset life right the way through society. I just mentioned Johnny Walker Whiskey. How many families has that ruined? Uh, listen, right? uh, Beer, alcohol, yeah. alcohol. Yeah, it's like it's it's people will not look at it like that because <sighs> obviously they'll think drugs are legal. People can't have it. Yeah, but so you got to remember you could go yeah. in Harrods and buy cocaine up until 1914. You could go into Harrods and buy heroin yeah. and cocaine yeah. Yeah, could, yeah. over yeah, the could, counter. Yeah. Right? First world wears to send it out. It to was the nine, yeah, that's why they just yeah. send it to the troops. Yeah. Right, 1914. It's where society puts these barriers up and says, this is legal, that's legal. It's a very hazy old line. And one of the biggest, if you talk about wrecking lives, as, as Andrew said, and families, has to be alcohol. And yet That's there's the people sitting camera. in the House of Lords, Lord Tenant, mm. Guinness family. All these people, you know, it's a very murky, like, it's not straightforward as you no, think. I think, yeah. I think there's two sides to that in fairness, Sydney, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. the same thing, alcohol, yeah, it destroys lives. But I don't make Johnny Walker and I don't bring alcohol anyway, mm. right? But the reality of it is this, you're right, you know, it's a murky thing. The biggest problem is with any substance misuse is support, okay? And... The government don't spend enough money on support or awareness, okay? So yeah. some drugs, admittedly, aren't as harmful as others. But the attitude that government has is always punish, punish, punish. They don't look at the psychology right. behind it and say, well, maybe kids are going to take ecstasy tablets anyway at a festival, so why don't we test them? Let them take them now, test them, make sure they're clean, and then let them take them. But at least there's people there. If something does go wrong, they can protect them. Yeah. Why can't you go into a a high street shop yeah. and buy a gram of cocaine if you want to buy it knowing full well Uncut, not, what's in there yeah, right, okay stuff, because yeah. believe me if you ever go to a cocaine lab which you would have been a cocaine lab Steve you see the shit that goes in now yeah. all the petrols the ethers oh, I mean terrible. cement all cement, kinds of yeah. shit it's an horrendous eat, eat, experience yeah, yeah, horrendous yeah. experience yeah. you never put it in your nose if you knew it was in there not to mention <laughs> the cuts so I've known you know, drug people in Mexico that have put cuts in there, stuff that they put in tires, it's yeah. cancerous, and people are putting yeah. cancer straight up into nose. their brain, up right, up your nose into your brain. Mm -hmm. So I know what goes into stuff, right? And the relative it is, if you educated young people more on the journey, and the same for alcohol as well, because we don't yeah. know, was part of warehouse parties, James, I was doing these things in the, you know, the, the, the late 80s, and that was a big buzz at the time, and it wasn't the government that stopped us, it was the breweries because no one was drinking alcohol. They were all drinking Lucas and taking drugs. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not a fool as to why, because of course, the government, of course, the most powerful people, as you said, were in government. We had MPs yeah. under there, you yeah. know, had them in their yeah, palm the, of their the, hand. The lobby companies. So, You've got to remember as well, um, to a degree, this has to be said, that crime, right, has become an industry. There's certain areas in America, right, where the whole community works in the local prison. Yeah. Right? They've got 2.7 million prisoners in America. That's about 1% of the population, right? And they manufacture goods, they work, right? If you suddenly started legalizing and decriminalizing the Class A drugs and that, which would take a lot of crime off the streets, stop a lot of shoplifting, or, or loads right the way across the board, right? 
they they would be up in arms. It's become an industry. Barristers, judges, uh, magistrates at court, police. Yeah. I mean, America has got the DEA. They've got the sheriff's department. They've got the state police. Alcohol, arms, and tobacco. <laughs> yeah. They've got about 15 different law suits. And if you suddenly started eradicating, taking the crime away from the equation, they would start falling apart. Mm -hmm. And it's got too strong, it's got too much, and it's become an industry. Yeah, it's a That's big my industry. Belief. Yeah. They, they've, they've gone, the, the Americans, are, are similar to us over here, the Americans are, have come off slavery and gone yeah. into having they have. slavery, slavery by the back door, Steve. You know, there's still slavery. The, the amount of black people who's in prison it's in America... slavery by the back door. It's ridiculous compared That's to the amount correct. of people that the, the in in the population. Yeah. 18% of population is black in America. Yeah. 50 60% is in the prisons. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's getting like that over here. Yeah. yeah. Anything the Americans do, we, we'll follow 10 yeah. years later. Yeah. You know, the Yankee it's a massive industry in America. It's always been said. Does that play a bigger part in your conscience you see, because you knew it was going in the gear and you then accepting it goes, you know what, I fucked up. <coughs> like, obviously, Sydney, you have not really... Well, but the gear that I was actually caught with, believe it or not, came back as 91% pure cocaine. So there wasn't really a stigma in my corner as far as, oh, I've been bringing poisons or toxins in. And, and I think over about 92% pure cocaine, it starts to break down back to oil again. Yeah. So it was about as pure as you could get it. That was that was the um, yeah, but I think Andrew's saying people can still get addicted to it, no matter if it's clean or not. People still die oh, yeah. from it. They get, like, get addicted to fifteen yeah. percent cocaine. Yeah, but yeah. Co cocaine. Yeah. Listen, I used to do a lot of coke, but back in the in the in the nineties, right? As the main the, the late eighties and the nineties, right? And it's one of the easiest drugs to walk away from, in my opinion, right? There's a psychological addiction. You think oh, I've got to have a line of coke, and it's, it's psychological. But the actual physical effects of pulling out away from coke is next to nothing. Yeah, but it's a dopamine kick if somebody's struggling. Like the amount of people yeah, that are yeah, 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 struggling with it. That's, that's the psychological yeah, aspect yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking about. But I mean, if you yeah. come off heroin, right, well, this is the difference between cocaine and heroin. If you come off of heroin, you're in agony, right? The muscle cramps, that I've seen them when they've come into jail. They're in a shocking state. You don't get that with coke. No. No way, mate. What stuff? What sort of stuff was put in the coke, Andrew? Okay, so basically, Overcoat, what they used to do, yeah, pure cocaine, right, which was produced at the labs, as you know, down in Bolivia. You got cement; it's one of your uh, products. Obviously, from the leaves, the leaves are trampled down. That makes a, a, a mush, basically. You've got ether; that's to go in for the final yeah, cut. That, that You've got a, a petrol out, diesel, yeah. which goes in there as well. So it's all about, these are all very toxic yeah. things going in there. Before we even start to wet cuts now, when FARC basically introduced the 10% tax, which they put on the cartels, so anyone travelling through the water streams of Colombia to get it down into mainstream, they charged them 10% additional to the price. They don't want to put the price up because in Holland and places like that, people wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't want to pay the increase, right? So what they've done was they started cutting it from the labs to make back the money, right? So, you know, stuff was going in there like you couldn't believe, James. Believe me. Take those gospel. Right, mm -hmm. always end in pain as well, didn't it? Before you even get it out, so by the time you even get it out, before you get it to Holland, before you get it anywhere, and they're going to put another hit in it. And there are the benzocaines and novocaines, that's it, benzocaine, you know, you've got lots of different cuts driving. they could put into it, right? Which ain't so harmful. The reality is, the dentists use them to numb your teeth, but. <laughs> what it's been through the process, forget about it getting to the little guy that gets the pub grub yeah, who's yeah. liable to put anything from Ajax to bloody well um a, a, what the thing is, the thing they put in sugar. I don't know what it's called. Saccharin. No, nah, whatever it is anyway. You know, so people will cut the thing from yeah, hell to eternity. Yeah. But forget about cocaine, powder cocaine. Let's talk about someone taking it and turning it into a rock. And we're talking about people aren't addicted to cocaine. Crack is the most addictive drug. That yeah. is on the face of this earth, and that is cocaine. So when you see what that does when to you people, up. you see people. I've seen people go from people with lots of money, looking really healthy, into that and skin in no period of time. Yeah. So, and I used to have the conscience to say, "Oh, my gear is pure, and it comes in, and it's people are <laughs> sniffing it." So am I really going to tell myself that when it's such a high, good quality grade that you ain't going to go back to the street and kids are going to make serious money out of that? Do you know what I mean? That's getting stressed, getting washed. But I used to, um, in, in fairness again, <coughs> I'm playing devil's advocate here to a degree, I used to 
um, smoke a bit. I used to get good cocaine, wash it up. It goes oily at first in the spoon, then you cool it down, it goes into a solid... Free base. Uh, free base. <laughs> we used to call it free base, then I call it washing it up. And I'll tell you what, I realised I started to get a bit of a problem. This is around about 2001. I still remember the year, right? And I thought, sod this. It's, it's like it's costing me money. And also, it was making me feel... I was waking up on a Monday morning and wanted a pipe, right? I packed it in, right? I started getting sweats, a bit of the first bit, straight down the gym, hard workout, sat in the sauna, bucketed it out. And I mean, it come out in bucket loads of sweat. A week later, I was back perfectly good. But and not we, everybody's like, on the same boat because when I was on it, you can it kick was, it out. It's the point I'm making. Yeah, anybody can. can anybody can make changes, but once it's gripped you, it depends how your life is like. So if you're on it, some people find it harder to yeah, get that's, off. It if they've got nothing else, yeah. I had other things. I mm. had a lovely family. I had my own children. Um, I had grandchildren. Right, so it was like, what are you doing? Getting hooked on a pipe when I've got my grandkids going, granddad. That's you know, what it, got you up there, though. Yeah. It doesn't mix, does yeah. it? You know? The, yeah. the biggest report that was done was from Vietnam when all the, the soldiers were coming back from uh, Vietnam on a heroin. Yeah. But very few got addicted because they had the family support around them. There's very few yeah. addictive uh, soldiers in, in America compared to what they started off with. But yeah, you know that thing, I think that's an integral part of human nature. We, we say whether you've got a family or you don't, oh, I feel sorry for people who haven't got a family, obviously. Yeah. It's integral, it's actually ingrained in our DNA to have family around you. Park animals. Right, yeah. yeah. It's, it's there, whether you, no matter what type of character you are, it's there. And if you're lucky enough, where, which I am, Steve, as I'm at, you've got family around you, like when I come out of prison, I'd be two kids, grandchildren. You know, it, you need that. Yeah. And if you ain't got that, I'll tell you what will replace it, like Andrew said, without a doubt, it's probably a crack pipe. Yeah, but loneliness is a bigger killer on the planet. That's why when you're lonely, you'll, you'll go to the external stuff to try and fix that loneliness. Yeah. yeah. But I like you says that when I made the changes, it was for me. I had to, you have to change for yourself, but I had to do it for your kids as well. So when you're trying to change... I've, I've I've lost so many people to heroin, coke, yeah. all the other shit because they couldn't get off it. Heart attacks. Yeah, well, I lost two brains, tumors, the all the madness that comes with it. Like, how hard is it as well when you've got kids? Like, when you go to prison, like, how does that then affect the other side of things? Like, when you're trying, my kids stuck by me even more than if I weren't in jail. I mean, the, the fact that I got jailed, um, they weren't ashamed of me or anything, although they didn't show that they were ashamed of me. They just thought I got involved in something and I got caught. That's it. And when I come out, the kids stood by me. me even my ex-wife stood by me. Um, so I was lucky. What about you know? yourself, Andrew? The relative it was James. I, I, you know, I can't... I had a brilliant, beautiful upbringing. I had no reason to do what I'd done. I'd yes, done it I by a choice. I, I chose to be an organised criminal. Everything I'd done was very calculated. I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd done it and I enjoyed doing it. And until I grow a conscience, I knew I would never do it again. You know, and the reality of it is, as Sidney did say, people can go and they have a nice lifestyle. You can go for saunas, but people who are taking crack cocaine haven't got the kind of money to be going to a health club, gym, sweating stuff out and all that. They're going to go home to their kids, beat the wife oh, up, you know, and they're going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. The great bulk, I agree, are on the floor getting their dull money and going down with a gyro and getting and getting crack, or and, what you used to be a gyro, getting crack. I agree with you. But there's also a middle class that uses that smokes coke, sniffs coke and smokes coke. It's moved well into the middle classes. You must know that. Yeah, it's always been in the middle class. Well, it started there, there didn't you know what though, James? Right? This is the thing that a lot of people don't get and this is the maddest thing. The whole middle class circle, the social gram after dessert, do you know what I mean? For the dinner party. Yeah, that's true. This is their, this is a social thing which is acceptable. Well, it is acceptable in terms of, you know, I mean, within the judicial system, judges, barristers, you know, lawyers. They're not going all, all, all do it. It's either. a social thing to them. They're not thinking of the price of the kid on the street, okay? Because they have to put themselves up to get that gear, okay? To give them gear to supply them, right? So when people are sitting there talking about politics and they're talking about making rights to the world and all these other wonderful things, <coughs> more damage, right, out of self-satisfaction, that's what it is, let's face it, right, without thinking of the consequences down the line. Now, 
you know, the government, for example, says have more police. Well, with the prison service and probation is a downstream service. So more police, more people arrested, more people go to prisons, build more prisons. Now, we're not being realistic about rehabilitation. You're locking people up. You're not rehabilitating them, right? So they're coming out with a bigger, higher crime rate. And the yeah. money that it's costing, yeah, is far more phenomenal than it will be if you've actually used common sense. Three things stop people reoffending, okay? If you can give them skills, training, and give them a career, a profession, yeah. or something they're going to feel pride in doing, you can employ them and they can work in that field, gives them a new circle of people, they're out of that chain, and if you can house them, they can have a roof over their heads. So money in your pocket, something to do, which you feel pride in doing, or you feel skilled at doing it, and you can go home to a bed at night, you'll see reoffending be reduced. Mate, so I what, guarantee what, what, you by 90% in If you country. go round, Andrew, if you went round to the average prison, the big, especially the big prisons, they're so overcrowded, right? The, and, yeah. and, and the amount of money, I think the total cost, the spend on the prisoners and rehabilitation, I believe it's about 3.8 billion, right? Now, in, a, in an economy that produces roughly 800, 800 billion pound a year in tax taxes, or well, that's the total revenue that comes into the government, right? About 130 billion goes on the, on the National Health Service. Three and a half billion for, for prisoners and rehabilitation, jailing them, rehabilitation. It's a joke, mate. There's no rehabilitation. They're spending 70 billion on defence, on missiles that we never use. Yet the rehabilitation of prisoners, which Andrew says, it's a joke. How hard is it? Is there much help for you in prison, Stephen, if you <coughs> genuinely want to make changes? No, it's hardly any. Yeah. Like Fulsorton, Loudon really Grange, a couple of thousand, I think there's 5,000 in Fulsorton. Two and a half thousand on each side where you've got the non-side and you've got the, the normal side. And the education was, I think, about the most I've seen in the 90 in education. All the rest was in slave sweatshops, really. Just earning money to live while they do in the prison. Get decent wages in the workshops, but you get nothing in education. And you know, 90 places out of two and a half thousand. Is that why a lot of people are just reoffending? Yeah, there's no rehabilitation. No I mean, it was in Florida, was it? Was it, was it about 2,000 cons, was it? 2,000 in there, and again, there was only yeah. 80, 90 uh, in education. All the rest was working. Yeah, yeah I used to go in education. That's, I think that's where I met you, actually. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and even then, it was only very, very, very surface-level education. Yeah. It wasn't like, for instance, oh, what do you want to do? Well, I want to, I want to be a carpenter. All right, go to the wood workshop. And now there was no wood workshop. <laughs> I want to be a bricklayer. Jobs that you could come out of jail and go and earn about 800 quid a week, for yeah. instance, right? There was none of that catering for any of that. It was teaching you a bit of English and maths to people that can hardly read and write, wasn't it, Steve? Yeah. Basically. How hard was it for you to come out? If you've got the pilot's license, was there people well, still trying to get on you? It, it wasn't. It wasn't hard for me to come out because I, I was fortunate enough to have money put by the. the I, I made a settlement with the um, proceeds of crime people, right? And it was eighty grand, right? And I said to my barrister at court, this was after about six months after I got sentenced. If I pay this, is that the lot? And he got a written guarantee that they would not pursue me anymore if I if I gave them the eighty thousand. They'd frozen the account anyway, right? That the money was in. So I gave them the 80,000 and, and walked away from it, right? And when I come out, obviously, you know, allegedly, I've got money put aside that I live off quite comfortably. Not extravagantly, but comfortably. How hard is that when you've done all the graft, <laughs> putting your lives in danger? Listen, obviously you've said destroying other lives, but when the proceeds of a crime starts happening, you start losing property, you start losing money, That is that a, what's harder? The time in the prison are losing the money. The reality is this, and I always say this to people. If you've got the money, pay it, okay? You, unless you're an idiot, right? Unless you can't make money, okay? Then you hold on to your money, okay? And I've seen people do it, and I've seen people just haven't got it. They got a ridiculous figure on them <laughs> as proceeds of crime. Yeah, they, they haven't got that money, but they're fattening up for the kill. That's what they're doing, yeah. and they throw this big thing on them, and then they have to do 10 years or whatever amount of years in prison because they get a ridiculous proceeds of crime order yeah. on them. And they do it a lot. It's an extra punishment. It's an extra tablet. But to me, 
if you're capable of making money, right, and I don't mean spell of the drugs here, if you've got the ability to be a good businessman, that's all the art is, you need your freedom, okay? Because you're not going to do it in prison. All you're going to do is waste more time. I walked into prison, James, and listened to how I thought, looked at it. You need 10,000 hours of <coughs> study to be an expert in, in a field, 10,000 hours. Usually people take 10 years to do it over a period of time. I walked into prison, and they walked into prison and thought, you know what? Just being in here, every single thing, if I watch, listen, and learn, okay, in three and a half years of this, I'm an expert in that field. <coughs> and you've got a multi-billion pound industry, as he just said, which is the prison establishment rehabilitation okay so what will stop anyone who's got lived experience who's in prison not understanding how it works and look for the faults in it and actually go about trying to change it and if you're accepted you've made your own ticket and no one can come to sell me you know any person who's I don't know, given the post by the government to work as a, you know, head of this or head of that, can tell me about a prison or about rehabilitation or about the street. Because I've been there. I understand yeah. how that works. I can tell you every problem. I can tell you why someone gets up in the morning and why they're angry. Why someone gets pissed off because they can't get their application filled and get their clothes or their trainers in or a book or a visit or a phone call. Someone who's sitting and given a job and they're coming out of Eton or Cambridge or where they it doesn't, you know, not being funny yet. You can cover it privileged, not they've privileged, not it doesn't matter. They've you ain't got, got that experience that yeah. we've got. No, so they're, they're, they're there's fine, more people you know. woke up and thought, you know what? I've had enough of this game, but I'm actually going to get involved here and I'm going to change the lives of people that I was one of them, yeah? And I'm going to do something now and actually say, you know what? I've had enough of listening to what you're saying. I'm going to show you what I think can be done. You, this system will be changed, James. Yeah. Because yeah, brand is slavery will probably go against us. It's yeah. a hell of a lot to take on, isn't it? And uh, if, at the end of the day, will they listen to you? If you're going to take on challenges and start smuggling tons of drugs all around the world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. anything. Oh, you can do point. anything. Yeah. So no one could tell me tomorrow morning I can't do something. The worst thing yeah. you could do is say, you can't do it. No, but are you up against mm. the brick wall with these people? Though? That's the point. Every, it's not every, that you haven't got the ability to do it. I'm not suggesting that for one moment. I'm saying that society as such, once a con, you're always a con, whether you like it or not. Yeah, but you've got to force it into them. You know, what you're doing there and uh, everything, it, it's not easy, is it, what you're doing? You're oh, having, having well, to well, ram it down your throat, aren't you, yes, to, to, to get on. an inch forward. But my goodness, it's, I'm, it's, I'm trying it's myself. not easy, is it? You know, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Listen, the thing's this, right, at the end of the day, and I do, you know, I'm a very controversial character. I've been that way all my life. And even to this day, I get it like, you know, you know, someone jokingly said to me the other day, he said, the AP Foundation is Britain's underworld's answer to Illuminati, right? right. As a joke, yeah. yeah. But I say, fair play, I've got to get those kind of things because some of the people I still associate with can be looked at as very colourful. But these are the people, James, that young people listen to. Yeah. Because it ain't no good having, you can't have a guy that's done a burglar and he's come out and he's changed and he wants to help. But if you've got people who are looked at as serious, serious criminals who were guys supposedly who really had their finger on the pulse, and those guys turn and say, I've had enough of this, and they're going to go and talk in a school, or they're going to go and say, it don't work for this reason, and I was on top of my game, because you know who I am. Mm -hmm. They listen. Okay. Now, as I said, you're going to get scrutiny. They're going to get, you know, the police is setting up some sort of organised crime group. And I do get it all the time. I won't lie to you. You know, for a probation officer the other week, I went to visit a prison at the request of the governing governor. I've told her I've, my PA forgot to send if the, or I've got someone PA about the visit. Those friends have locked me up. Do you know what I mean? Right. So every day you face challenges, but bring them on. Do you know what I mean? Bring the challenges yeah. on. Right. The more challenges you bring, the more we'll show you what we can do, you know, and that's what it is. So, you know, come on, man, you've mm -hmm. sharks are born swimming. See, when you were doing like <laughs> Genesis and the rave scene and, and killing it, like, was that not enough at that time in your life? For that time, that was that was for that time. Mm -hmm. Everything is a season. Do you know what I mean? You're not mm -hmm. going to live in the past. Paul McCartney, people say, why don't you have a Genesis party and? And I say, as Paul McCartney famously says, when he's asked to do a Beatles reunion, sometimes his memory is better than the reality. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Do you want to be a yeah, 55 yeah, year old man bouncing around with a beer belly and a rave Men taking these? You know, so the memory's no. brilliant. You know, you put on reggae sunsplash, biggest event, oh. lovely, you've done this, you've done that. Yeah, done all these wonderful things. But stepping out of prison, I've now taken on the biggest challenge of my life. Because what I've done is I've said, I'm taking on the establishment, not as a, you know, <laughs> fighting them. I'm actually saying, possible. hold on now, what you're doing now, it's actually you're doing it wrong. <clears throat> all right? And I'm going to have a crack and let's see how that looks. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean, James? Now, that's what you call balls, brother. Do you yeah. know what I mean? We've we, we, we got far balls. Do you think you're going to get with it, though? That's the, I'll go all the way, my friend. Well, good luck to you. I, I, I hope you do. And how, it's a do, tough, tough uh, one. When does the tables turn for them to see, do you know what he is changing? Will they ever say well, that? or? I think I've got it, you know. As I said, <clears> we've <throat> become the biggest contractor now for a brand new prison that's being opened. I mean, the drawdown keys for a half a virtually half a billion pound prison, I mean, that's trust. Do you know what I mean? You know, we trusted in Westminster to run, you know, their gangs and exploitation units to put people in prus and you know, people referral units, youth clubs, that's trust, do you know what I mean? You know, to get called up by governing governors of prison saying, can you put together a youth incentive that basically, you know, you can put some programs together over short and long periods. I call back to Whitemore. I was an inmate in there. Do you know what I mean? Guys saw your podcast and called and said to my secretary, look, you know, I love what he's doing. Yeah. We want to bring him back to Whitemore to actually run a wing with young people who are coming in doing 40 year wrecks from yeah. you know from from from, from uh, where is it Ellsbury and I'm like he's watched me on a podcast this guy was a OMU officer and I was an inmate there not so long ago and you're saying you've been cleared by the security by the number one governor to go back to the prison yeah. so anything is possible you how know? are you treated when category like how how differently are you treated than the A-wing is that well, I, I was triple cut out for nearly eight years, yeah. and that was completely different. So we just cut off from everybody. The prison inside the prison in Whitemore. Baseball sake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I mean, I was in the block in the, in the triple cut out as well. So to be in the block in, the, in triple cut out is pretty bad. How do you control that mindset to think that you might never get out? No, I, I never thought out. that because I always had a date. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how people with life sentences manage with that because they, some of them could possibly not, not get out even though they might have a now. date you know but we, we, I think all of us here was lucky that we had a, a, a date absolutely mm -hmm. that's the best thing that you know we always had something to work to did you see a lot of suicide in prison with people struggling yeah seen a few people die and try and kill other people to try and get more prison and you don't believe the madness that you see in prison mm -hmm. I've, I've seen a raster walk into the kitchen and within 30 seconds run down the landing screaming Oiled him with a bald with head, ball. you know, it was a full blown raster, yeah, big oiled. man, yeah, what, oil all oil, over his oil, kipper. Oil, yeah, yeah. You know, it's I've some terrible it, thing. Seen it, I've, I've seen a, a bloke called Dr. Death strangled to death in front of myself, you know, by other lads who, who was in trouble with the black gangs, ran into a cell and just grabbed the oldest person they could, so you know, so they could stay in prison a bit longer, you know, yeah. You see a lot of bad things in prison, I think, don't you? Yeah, I think in dispersals as well. Dispersals are bad. It's a, different, it's yeah. a different, different... It's like... There are like two systems of prisons yeah, in this country. Is, there, is there, there are regular prisons, you know, from Swell site, uh, you know, Ladder Grange to into Wandsworth. Them. Then you've got the seven, the dispersal, or the five dispersals, three of them obviously, Gold Cates, Belmarsh, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Strange Ways, and uh, one of Milton Keynes. But your five main dispersals, James, is a different world altogether. You know, as I know, doing natural life sentences, not yeah. coming out. Do you know what I mean? People we know have, you know, rubbed that people in prison, they're on a life sentence, they find a couple of people out because someone's given some money. You know, you have hitmen that exist in that environment. Yeah. You have everyone that lives, exists there. The upside is, you know, you can cook your own food. The upside is, it is a community. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there is all that stuff that there is that kind of thing and that's proper bird. Do you know what I mean? So, when you've experienced that, you got to say, you're going to sit here probably for the rest of your life and many very dear friends I have will never come out of those dispersals. You know, they know that. Everyone knows that. And I think, what a waste. Do you know what I mean? Because that's the worst thing you can have. And you talk about suicides in the locals, you know, loads of us be a listener. So we're stringing themselves up. Very that's few of them will die. Yeah. When someone strings themselves up in dispersal, they're dead because yeah. they mean to kill themselves. Okay. And, you know, 
it's, it's, it's just different and it's very dark. You know, you, you've got that clad every day. Could be your last day. Yeah. It could be a question of just before bang up, someone you forgot to say, or you're all right, you've ignored them, any little thing, they're sitting in there, they've got little mental health problems, they're nuts going all night. Next morning, you'd be in bed, that door breaks at 7.15 or 7.45. They could come and chew you to death while you're laying down. It happens, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like that's an environment of proper dog eat dog. So back to the question, any young person listening to this today, is that how you want to live? Does it screw kill anybody in prison? I think that's a, people would say to people say that's a great exaggeration, right? You know, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Inmates kill inmates. That's what does happen, right? Jeez. You know, um, the days of the one oh way and you used to have a you know a few tasty wow. screws and all that back in the seventies, who would you know what I mean? Well the scrubs ones, that. they all got jailed, didn't they? But yeah, and that was back, 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 back in, in that was the, that was the early eighties. Yeah, and really? same yeah. thing you had with police, James. You know, you had some police. I heard a podcast the other day with someone who was he was interviewing, and uh, he was talking about the police. Well, the thing he was meant to say was it was called the um, first aid kit. So flying squad used to have the first aid kit, which was a replica gun, the balaclava. Had the gloves and they used to stick it in a second car so that if you did catch out someone too soon, because they were doing a wreck on a bit of work and they, they've gone and grabbed them with nothing on them, they used to get this first aid kit out of the car, put it on them. Do you know what I mean? And police back then, as I said, you know, they, I mean, they would really go any, they would do anything. And there are still police like that today. Yeah. We know this because I've paid off police. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But the reality of it is, it's a different kind of gravy. The damage that's being done now are criminals against criminals. You know, there's no criminal fraternity as there used to be, where, you know, the criminal did stick together, they had each other's back to a certain degree. They worked as firms. You know, it's a vicious thing out there now, you know? How do you look? back at the life now thinking with the shit that goes on now with there's no loyalty that was there loyalty back in the day the 80s 90s people it's tight where you could work together and you know you've had each other's back i think what it is the in anything like this um there are phases when people become first get into the game young kids some of them are very loyal to each other they have each other's backs because they haven't really seen the full what will happen? They haven't seen a big sentence. They haven't seen too many people get rubbed out yet. And then as that goes along, you know, you find you need to be your own man, okay, in that game. And by being that, you need to be self-dependent. So you can have a lot of people. We have a thousand associates. But the minute you start to partner up with people and the minute you start to stake, create what is a firm, number one, you're very easy susceptible to the police because you've got weaknesses all around you. There's going to be a weak link there somewhere. But more importantly, it's everyone wants, and there's never, there's never a level playing field. Never everyone's going to get the same split. Never happens like that. And then people will start to, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And people will then feel jealous. And that's where it all starts to go wrong. Because they might even mean to fuck you up, but it's what they say to someone on a phone carelessly. Oh, he's making this or he's doing it. Other. That phone's tapped because you're talking to. He's grassed you up inadvertently, mm. right? You've got yeah. another person sweet who tells another up, person, sure. sweet grassing, another person who tells so-and-so, gets into the wrong ears, your life's in danger because they're going to come on your doorstep four in the morning, ballied up, do you know what I mean, and want to kill you. I take you, get money off you, right? So you've got all these elements that you're facing every single day. And if you're going to sleep with a gun under your bed, a metal door, do you know what I mean, <sighs> and literally walk around a bulletproof vest, why would you want to be in that life anymore? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, it may be different if you're sitting in a yacht somewhere and you're out of arm's reach, but would you want to be doing it here? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I would no. do it anyway anymore, yeah. but yeah. Does, does anybody ever make it out? <clears throat> does anybody ever make it out? Clean life, they've made their dawn, they've disappeared. With, into the, with the big money. Size. Yeah, people, obviously people do that, but uh, there's a lot of intermediates who make it out, you know, they get in for it and do That's 10 right. kilo, 20 kilo, and that's it for them. Uh, there's a street in, in Manchester called Wormslow Road and uh, there's a lot of uh, cafes and restaurants and everything. There's a lot of people in there started off in the 60s, 70s and they smuggle one kilo and that'd be it. So a lot of people make it out. It's just when you get bigger, that decision becomes a lot harder, doesn't it? It's, uh, Is that what you just found, one. that the bigger you went, the harder it was to get out? Yeah. Some people, it's a means to an end. Other people, it's become a lifestyle choice. Yeah. And that's the lifestyle choice that's just dangerous because 
you're not just getting out of the game, you're getting out of the your everyone because you've created a circle of people around you which are that lifestyle. And, you know, you've got the missus and you've got the kids and it's suddenly, you know, her friends is, you know, his missus, friends with that friends and you've got this whole social circle. So if one person's at it, everyone's at it because you can't change, you can't mm. stop. The only way you can do it is by stepping away from it, putting up the fence really high and then when you're completely out of it, then you can go back and you can talk to these people. Then you can have conversations with these people because these people know you've drawn them you've you've you, you know you've put a marker out there you said don't cross that line because i'm not going there yeah you know if you value our friendship don't even ask me to do that don't even ask me to get involved in that whatever you're saying please don't talk about it when i'm in the room and that's respect do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so if you can get out you get out like that you know but it ain't easy why is it so cool though to, to back in the day like if i'd seen Growing up where I grew up, Glasgow, I've seen the convertible and a nice girl, and I think that's a, that's a cool fucking life. Like, why don't. is it such a turn on that life, that lifestyle? Like, you've ran the pubs, you've ran the doors, you've had the power, you've had the money, <sighs> but why is it, but yet, the like, destruction that causes not just your own life, but everyone you it's love. It's what you do like, when you, I mean, in my case, when I was a youngster and obviously didn't have much at all, you walked around your own town and looked around and you saw people that had it, you know? And, um, I remember getting my first flash car by the time I made the money in straight as well. I made the money straight. I had a drop head Mercedes Sports. And just to drive around in that car at that age, I felt great. And that was what, you know, you want that type of thing. Then you see someone else who, who's, like I saw my mate taking flying lessons. And I wanted to do that. You see people around you and you draw your, your markers from them. Mm -hmm. never, what you want to be. Never think about taking flying lessons yourselves. <laughs> nah, no. I'd rather sit in the first class. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, how many planes, yeah? <laughs> yeah? I'd rather I sit in I learned in Holland, mate, did you? Yeah. What, flying? Yeah. Flying, yeah. Oh, right, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, mm. I'd rather Did you ever take the... your test or not? Well, did somebody you... else did for me, yeah. <laughs> oh, you Somebody <laughs> else's name, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had, I, we had a, a Cessna. What a Hilversham. We had a big Cessna 480 12. Was it up at Hilversham? Just an awful thing. Hilversham, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. I used to We, we own that airport, airport, really. I'll tell you what. Well, we, own, we own the bloke who owned it. Yeah, Hilversham. Sort of I know yeah. it well, mate. I know mm -hmm. it very well. Great little airport, that. Great little airport. So, see, when you were up, did that? Did you feel more free when you were up there and, and kind of. <laughs> in the, in the planes? Class? Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic in a plane. You can. Mm -hmm. It's hard to beat flying. It really is. It's nothing like yeah. flying on a passenger jet. No. Right? That's that's obviously you're right, you're flying, we know you're flying, but you're you're detached. When you're up in a small plane and you're flying it, you're hands on, aren't you? Yeah. You feel the air, you actually feel everything, every little move, every, isn't it? Every little move. Like I'd I could in the end, I could adjust my left foot without realising it on a rudder and an opposite turn to correct when you start working you, you turn into an auto pilot, don't you? Yeah. And you just, just by feel, mm -hmm. feeling the plane, you know. How do you sleep now with all the shit that you've done, you've been through that? How's the sleep <sighs> patterns? Like, do you sleep okay or do you, do you go back a lot of times I, in the past? The, I never missed a night's sleep in prison either. I, I've got I'm what, got one of them metabolisms that just falls asleep. Just adapt to it? Yeah. So you're it's not about life. adapting or anything. It's just the way my system works. 10, 11 o'clock at night, I'm ready for bed. Mm -hmm. Never been a clubber. I hate to go and being out at 12 o'clock at night. To finish my even it's now it's getting a bit late now. Years ago, I was going to get home <laughs> two or three days. Thinking of Sydney's going to drop us off in a plane or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what about how's your sleeping patterns and now, Andrew? Like, you know, that well, lifestyle? To be honest, yeah, I've you know, I've, I've, I've done it all, I've lived that life now. I, I, I'm a beautiful woman that I love very much. That you know, that's called home. Do you know what I mean? I can rest at night, all I've got to worry about is work. Yeah. I get up at five o'clock in the morning. Computer goes out at that time, preparing emails, you know, taking meetings from nine o'clock in the morning. It's a different world for me now, you yeah, know. But totally as I said to you, it's different. a different world. Yeah. And I'm happy with that world, you know. I can live with that. I can turn around and say to myself, you know what, the past is the past. Yeah. And I do talk about it because I have to. Because unless I can do that and say, I've lived this life, okay. So in order for me to say I've lived this life, I can't talk to a young person and say, well, actually, I don't know what it's like to have all this money or I've done all this stuff. I say, I've done it all. Yeah. And I'm telling you now, I'm here for a reason. Yeah. It amounts to nothing. You know, it amounts to death or prison cell. 
one of the two. That's a real simple option. Do you know what I mean? And definitely I'm getting shot. It means excess. You know, you, you, you're excessively living with drink, with booze, with women. You're yeah. doing that kind of stuff. Either way, it's yeah, destruction. Yeah, it's very much a Do you know what I mean? So coming really... back down to it, it kept your basic necessities. You know, if you can have a beautiful roof over your head and you can strive for better things and you've got someone beside, right by your side, and you've got your kids yeah, and people that mean things to you, mm -hmm. you can lock all that in together, your family, lock that together, you're the yeah. richest man in the world. Yeah. You couldn't give me a billion pounds to replace that. You couldn't give me that. I had a great day about two days ago walking up the canal, looking at the frozen water. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought back to uh, when I was inside thinking, when I was inside, I was oh, wanting to do that. Was That's it? what I wanted to do. Get out, get onto my bike, get into the countryside, walk on the moors, yeah. do all that. And now mm -hmm. I'm finally doing it. So see that yeah. life then, as you're chasing the money, you've got the power, you've got, you can basically buy anything you want to then just having basically nothing and walking along the canal but that's made you happier that like, yeah. then what is life about then what does it all come down to why well, do we think that we need the external stuff to be happy it's it's a system that's set up it's called a commercial system forcing every day that you was born you've been forced to say we need to have that we need to do this yeah, we need to drink this we need to eat that we need to kill animals and we need to eat them we need to do everything the commercial massive industry yeah. tells us that's what we want to do. And it's not going to change. It might change. It's sort of changing a little bit, isn't it? Because of the internet. Materialism. Like the this, about materialism. Materialism. Yeah, materialism the is, is, uh, it's the, it's the, the, it's the, the carrot in front of the donkey's nose, isn't it? All the time. You get to the age 12, 13, 14, 15, you ready to leave school and I want this. Then I want to get me house. Then I'd like to have a nice car. Yeah. And so when... Really, we, we just spoke, we touched very briefly about happiness walking on the canal. Happiness is a frame of mind, yeah. not necessarily geared to material attainment. It's not necessarily geared that way, but society would have you believe that have it you was. believe that, yeah, it's just a right? big and that's, that's sparkly box mm -hmm. of shites, really. Yeah, you know, and uh, comes, once, once the glitter wears off, you know, I mean, it's all right as a young man. I'm never going to knock it for a young bloke, I mean... By the time I was about 28, 29, I told you, I had a nightclub, I had a lovely apartment abroad, paid for, no mortgage, right? I had a Porsche 911, I had an aeroplane, all paid for, no finance at all. And do you know what? I still ended up sniffing coke and ended up in kitchens till six o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning with, with a crowd of people, no opus, do you know what I mean? I'd still end up there and I had all that. Why do you think that is? <sighs> Because once I actually got all the things I'm talking about, like the 9-11, all the things I had at that age, about 28, 29, I was still just me. You know, all they were was just glitter on a Christmas tree, you know? And at January the 1st, January the 2nd, where the Christmas tree has to come down. In other words, you face reality. Mm -hmm. And um, you realise that they are just trinkets, you know? That's why all just Tyson Fury is. They're not the be all and end all of happiness. I mean, Tyson Fury is a great example. He earns 100 million a fight, and yet he went down. He he went down with depression. The biggest depression of his life on yeah. all the belts yeah. and all the money. Blew up to 28 yeah. stone, right? Because he's lost that frame of mind. Your happiness is crucial. I'm sure Andrew will agree. Is your frame of mind. Mm -hmm. If the mind ain't right, it doesn't matter what you've got on the no. table, right? Well, the prime example of it is Epstein, yeah. Multi billionaire, who's still what? Epstein, the paedophile. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, he's got Epstein. everything, got, yeah, yeah, could have sorry. every woman he wanted, yeah. and the depravity of all yeah. that still yeah. forced him into children. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know. Yeah. Andrew Carnegie yeah. as well, one of the richest men in America. Yeah. He helped Napoleon Hill. They wrote, wrote Andrew the book. Carnegie, yeah. 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 He wrote the Famous. book uh, Think and Grow Rich, but he ended up dying alone in Livingston. Yeah. Billionaire. Did he really? Yeah, he yeah. died alone in Livingston. Like, oh, no, you talk no, no. about a feeling, you talk about the glitter and the glam, it's irrelevant, but we chase it. See if you've had the mindset that you've got now in your 20s, do you think your life would be so different? Yeah, I'd, I'd still be a millionaire, mm -hmm. but I'd be happy. Uh, I, you know, even when he had the, the, the bags full, this room full of money, I was never happy because it wasn't always mine. It was never all, always mine. But, you you walk out of that room and you, you're walking down the street on your own because you've got, yeah. really, when you're at our level, you've got one or two people maybe in the world that you can actually talk yeah. to and, and express your feelings about how you, you're doing and why you're doing yeah. it and where you're going. 
Yeah, but you probably you probably you're more long. money than me. Mm -hmm. I, was, I don't I care was what anybody says. You're always long. Jealousy. Did you feel that, Andrew? As well, the jealousy. Wasn't the jealousy. jealousy. People well. want to they happily help you spend it, but the jealousy because it's you know not theirs. People are jealous of you, and you're gonna. Yeah. You, you don't want to be. In, you don't want to be living like that. Whereas any given time, someone's prepared to stab you in the back. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's what it is. It literally is that. But I think it's soul searching, James. You know what happens is. You, you do things you said to me you would keep doing it yeah you keep doing it because it's constant greed it's a yearning until you've discovered something which is part of you that fills you up and that's gonna be money that's just gonna be something yeah, that makes you feel satisfied it. okay yeah. once you've got that it there's limits to everything and you know and i'm happy with that i'm happy with that otherwise you're like this beast going around yeah, relentlessly yeah, yeah. wanting more and more and more and more totally insatiable. and that's what it is it's you know you can't describe how it is but the reality of it is, it happens, and people say to me, would you change it all? As we said earlier, I couldn't change it all. And what I'm doing now is something I couldn't be doing had I not done all this, because I'm laying down legacy projects now. Now, that's a big word for me, yeah. because that would have never been my talk 20, 15 years ago. Legacy project means I'm not even doing it for me. I'm doing it for who comes after me now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's a big commitment to do that. Yeah. So, you know, my mindset has changed, but I had to go through this process to finally get it, you know. So, does that all come down to like an, a, an emptiness, it. like an emptiness within yourself, like a something missing, a loneliness, like to create something to try and feel some sort of empowerment? It's a yearning, that's why mm -hmm. we do the things we do. It's a hunger to keep doing achievement, satisfaction, gratification. It's wanting to succeed, wanting to be noticed, wanting to be known, wanting to make money, wanting to buy all the garments and all the yeah. artifacts that go with it, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? But when you turn around and think, I don't care anymore, I'm going to do me, I'm doing me, I'm going to be the best I can be, and let's see what happens. When you can do that, suddenly you look at the world in a different dimension. It's like putting <laughs> a set of glasses suddenly, you're blind before then, then you can see yeah. everything. And it's yeah. really simple to work out. I just wish if I'd worked it out when I was 18 years old. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but no man would have listened to you then. No. You, you can't, can't listen put to an old head on young as, shoulders, as, can as, you? As a, as a you mature know, man. You, you know. can't put an old head on young shoulders. Uh, How hard is that ever? feeling like you're walking along the canal? You've had rooms full of money, you've had planes, you've had it all. But then that feeling where you're walking along the canal, feeling kind of contentment, bliss, that. Like... Just a nice little feeling that you, you, I've never had in, in the past. You know, having my family right around me as well. You know, I'm a granddad now. Uh, but I'm also leaving my own legacy, you know, in, in, in the art that I'm yeah. creating. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to create it into a similar way to Andrew. Did you do the Kerstlers in Loudoun, Kerstler ones? I, I won the Kerstler oh, in, yeah, in yeah, Tinga. Yeah, I, 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 I won, the, I won the, the, the platinum and the, the, the bronze in the same year, 2011. Yeah. What's that? 2011, the, that's right. Yeah. Was, we the, went the, to that hall, didn't we, to be yeah. presented them. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, well, I, I got it's the Kerstler Award, 27,000 entrants uh, for painting and... Win. Thing. It's, it's really to hard to win. I won the, the platinum, the first prize yeah. of it Top yeah. in 2011, and uh, I won the in the same year. I won the the bronze prize. Yeah, I did like well. a bronze and a silver. Yeah. How did that uh, make you feel? Was that the first time you'd achieved? Well, something it's the same year that I got my degree as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a big party. That the the, yeah. the governor still wants me back there to Loudon Grange. Gareth, do you remember him? Yeah, Gareth uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and <laughs> Neil was it? Uh, <coughs> Martin O'Neill. Was I only knew Gareth as yeah. the uh, as the governor. Yeah, he, as it happens, he weren't a bad bloke. Yeah, he used to come round to me because I was supposed to run the magazine and I did a load of literature. I was always in Inside Times. I don't know if you remember, yeah. but I was in. Well, there. I won that as well. I did a competition. In I was that in well, there near enough every week. Double page. I was the most widely read writer in the English prison system. Yeah, and uh, I do articles, mm -hmm. send them off to Inside Time, thinking oh they might get in or whatever. You're lucky to get one in yeah. if you're lucky. And I'm getting in them every week. And, That's um, mad for what you guys have done in the past. I want three counsellors. <laughs> what you're doing now from the writing, the paintings, the things, the speaking you're doing with kids. It, you you don't know what that. talent yeah. you've got until it's been tapped. No. Do you? you know, I mean, I, I I never considered myself a writer, a great writer, whatever. Then I started writing, and obviously at first I weren't great, but I showed potential. And then gradually over two or three years of writing articles, political comment, so on and so forth, I just obviously become good at it because I won uh, three Kerstlers and uh, 
I uh, got in the inside times near enough every week, didn't I, Steve, at one time? I was always in there. So everything you've done in your life, what what's, would you say was the happiest moment? <sighs> the happiest moment? Yeah. God, that's a, that's a tough one, that is. Uh, Crime wise, our personal. Both anything right a moment you felt was a personal you know children. I've been children. I don't think you can pick one moment out, can you? Well, children in it, I suppose. In in general, there's, oh, there's... that was my happiest time having kids and yeah. and, and now grandkids. You know, so you age, Stevie boy. Well, I don't care, mate. I'm, I'm happy to be alive at this. <laughs> yeah, at sixty odd years old, <laughs> sixty four years old, and yeah. Yeah. got grandkids. My my next target in life is to to see great grandkids. Yeah, you'll get you know, twenty years away. Yeah, you know that's, well, that's you, my target. I've, I've got a, I've got a grandchild who's uh, sixteen, so I'm not far oh, off you're, it. You're all right. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Andrew? When was a, a moment like even if you're doing graft in Jamaica, if you were out of prison, or you're, things you're doing now, <sighs> did you ever feel? Like, do you know what? I'm happy. Do you know what? And this may be a sound completely insane, right? Hold this space because the best is yet to come. Do you know that? Of all yeah. the things I've done, I've done a few, that I've done a few things, I've done a few things, <laughs> believe it, but now, believe it or not, I have a feeling that the best is just yet to come. I'm with you there, mate. You know? And anyone you say that to, they say, you've got to be mad. Oh. Mid-50s. How can the best be yet to come? 50, it's yeah, about 64, to, mate. It's going to come. It's mm. on its yeah. way. I'm not giving up. I'm just starting. How much has belief no, right. come a big part of that to then believe that the best days are yet to come, believe yeah. that you can change the game like how much does the belief system come into play? You believe the yeah. belief in your mindset is what actually predicts your own future. If you get something in your mind and you're dedicated to it that much, not just a fly by night thought, but a, a, you know, really concrete, then you will attain it. You'll turn it into reality with a bit of luck. Do you think you could put your mind to anything and make it as big as what you have done, even if it was not legal uh... I think I struggle with brain surgery but apart from that <laughs> I'd have a go at anything yeah yeah. I think that's part of the way we are isn't it that we, we'll try what do you think anything? that ingredient is with this kind of calibre I guess that it's kind of deluded psychotic genius kind of could be yeah. you know, a little bit one. you know what it is right yeah <laughs> you've got to, it's not even hard to work out you just got to figure out what could I do yeah. not what I can't do Understand stuff that you can't do. Understand I can't fly a plane. I've got no intention of flying a plane. I would never do a parachute jump. Reason being, you're dead when you leave that plane. You save your own life. I don't need to do it. Never done a bungee jump. So I'll take risks which are necessary, but I would put loads of stuff in a container, or I used to, and take a risk again for prison for 30 years. So we take calculated risks, mm. right? But... You have to know limitations and you have to know what your potential is. So if you believe in something, you've got to think it out and say, oh, I want to become a rocket scientist. You've got to figure out, can I become it? And what route will I take to make it happen? Yeah, and it's the same psychology with smuggling. Thing. You know, can I get that there? How do I do it? What's the route? So as long as you plan it out and think, what assets have I got? I'm good at this. I'm good at that. I'm good at that. You could pretty much map out what you're going to yeah, do. Anything, yeah. It's your future. We're like a sat nav. We're tuned in to get where we want to get to. What happens when we don't get there is, like an idiot, we stop someone on some directions and they take us in a different direction. But if we tune that internal sat nav on to say, right, I'm going to do this, I'm going to become this in this period of time, you'll get there. With mm. all obstacles in your way, we'll still get there. Mm. But it's the you know lack of self-belief questioning your own self education listen to idiots education lack of education takes you off course yeah, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of self-sabotage come in like you say a lot of, I know people who's been into prison done 18 years 20 years done something stupid so they end up staying in prison like if your lives are going good same as you 28, 29 had everything ended up on the pipe like the self-sabotage come in a lot of play with yourself as your well, lives I, are going yeah. good I think it can do actually I think it's. I think you can sabotage yourself. I think it's chimp paradox. You think so? The monkey mind. Monkey mind. In your mind, you've got that mad thought. You know, if you're sitting somewhere, you have the maddest thought. Your mind goes across the room, it goes back in your head. Your feet and your arms don't leave the room and run around and come back to you, but your mind does every day. So when you have that thought and you don't address that thought properly or put that thought to bed as a mad thought, it comes back and that's where you find yourself locked up. Because you went and done something which was a mad fool, and you've not addressed it, say so that's nonsense. Yeah. That's never going to work. Instead, you go and do it. 
you know. And when you it's true, you like me because you know it's right. true. How many times it happened, Steve? All the time, dozens of times, right? All the time. Sometimes you've been lucky, got away with it. Yeah. Sometimes you haven't been so lucky. But if you address it as a mad fault, then you're all right because you take the, the logical faults and actually map out what the hell you're going to do with your life. Mm-hmm. You know, what do you need to do to stay on that path of making the right decisions? Like, how hard is that? to be staying on the path with, without the temptation without do you know what I'm struggling in now like how is that even harder because of the money he's made in the past just grow a conscience get a conscience once mm-hmm. you've got a conscience there it is is your moral compass do you know what I mean because yeah. if you're saying to yourself I wouldn't do this for these reasons I'm a man of my word I'm not going to do that you're right is that questioning your decisions um, then more you have to question your integrity mm-hmm. and why you're doing what you're doing but I think the age, uh, again, integrity is absolutely correct. But I think it comes down to, again, is age comes into it. Like, if we all got jailed, the three of us, when we were 25, served the 10 and got out of 35, you're still young and it's all ahead of you. You get to a certain age where, you know, you go, oh, come on, you know, is this enough, isn't it enough now or whatever, you know? And, yeah. and like you said earlier, crime, especially the, the habitat in prison, it's a young man's game. It's a young man's game. It's not for people our age. No, it's a death sentence for people our age. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. You know, so age does definitely have a, a bearing on your outlook do you for the pe- future. Do you know people in your age, though, that have ended up back on the game in yeah, their 60s? Yeah, loads. Loads. So loads. I honestly loads. don't know anybody my age who, who was, like, in my age group at school and that. People I still know from school and that. None of them are involved in that type of thing anymore. But there's people being in their sixties, seventies, and they've all been right? I like people in yeah. their sixties and in, and in their early seventies. Still doing. Gone yeah. and got themselves fifteen, twenty years. It's a mugs guy. That's yeah. a I was mugs. always I, chasing I had, a pan, uh, mate. Fucking mugs. George Reeves on. He was Pablo ba- Escobar's pilot. Yeah. <laughs> Escobar owed him three and a half million when he died, and yeah. the guy says, "Look, there's a turn for you." And he says, "Fuck it, you make twenty million. He done it. Took a ship in Australia, an extra twenty strikes, yeah, just got it. out seventy four. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, is yeah. that do you look at that and find I don't want to be that, or do you take more inspiration kind of from that? How easy it is to get sucked in, no matter if you think you're out or not. If you're a weak person, you're gonna, you know, every single time you fall in a hole, you will be you're every day you're walking around this hole, and it's every fucker just dying to push you in, yeah, right? Just that's what you've got to understand. So, you've got to keep your wits about you because if you make one false move or you slip an inch, mm-hmm. you're in, you know, and that's just as I said, down to you, you have to have integrity. You've got to, you know, be strong and you've got to make a decision and stick to it. That's mm. it, yeah. you know, and what? that's the yeah. fence. Put the fence how, up. How long have you got on your licence? Two months? Two months, yeah. What about you? Are you done? No, I'm another year and a half. What about... I'm the same as Steve, how, two months. Have you ever... yeah. Coming to the end, lads, like, yeah. you got, is it, that, would that ever become a release, like a, like a relief, something's took off your shoulders? But they wouldn't like... let me travel. I don't know about, because I've heard stories of other people edging towards the end of their licence period being allowed to travel. There's no, they would not let me travel to the very last day of it. Um, for obvious reasons, you know. Yeah, you were a pilot shit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, that doesn't help, Sid. <laughs> no, but all right. Yeah, but, right yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, perhaps I'm not that surprised. Yeah. Very, uh, that's not, Do that's you question not. that, though, as if to say, like, no, why, 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 why actually, you? I actually, said, done by, but I actually right, said right. to my probation yeah. officers, have you got it in for me? <laughs> right? And they said, seriously, they said, we have recommended, but we've got no reason to lie to you, that you can travel to Tenerife. So I used to live there. I've got a lot of friends there. And I lived in Tenerife. And I went, all I'm doing is going over there. You know, one of my daughters was born over there. And um, she said, it's, it's the home office. The home office will come back saying, not, not hoping it will help with no chance. Yeah, because yeah, you're not shot them harsh from there. And I said, you sure you're not shifting the blame? You know, but they, <laughs> both of them said, uh-huh. you know, no. You know. Play, can you play the victim sometimes when you genuinely uh, feel I, I did. changed? I did a little bit on this last one with probation. Uh, I put official complaints in and all that. And then when I sat down in the cold fucking light of day, <laughs> I thought, you, you know what? If I was probation, I wouldn't have fucking given yeah, the chance. Yeah, no. That's why I'm laughing no. at said He's thinking he's had that by not I you experienced this, Steve. Yeah. Um, but even when I was serving, as the last two years, they let you go to DCAT, didn't they? Yeah, I never got that. No, yeah, well, you, you didn't. But I did, right? Um, even before I went to DK, I was in a prison called The Mount where I still got a day release every what, twice a month or something, right? Every single time I got to the gate to be let out, 
right, yeah, uh, I've been like four of us. What they all, they've gone, they've gone, uh, right, yeah. Sorry, mate, mess up with the paperwork. Back to your cell. <laughs> so much so that the governor of the Mount Jail, when it happened to me about the fifth time on the trot, you know, I've got my brother waiting outside, they come and take me to have a nice bit of steak and chips and that, right? The governor of the jail, when I'm not having this, this, this man has been victimised, right? <laughs> Said to one of the screws on the wing, go and get your civilian clothes on, you'll take him right out for the afternoon. And he did that. He was a good man. But every single time, you know. Yeah. Can you feel like a victim, Andrew? Listen, right. I told you, I was a career criminal for 30 years, James. And one thing you realise is every time you go on trial, you're as guilty as sin. And you create this defence. You tailor it as best as you can. And God forbid you go down, right? The, the defence is so wrapped up in your head, you've actually convinced yourself you're innocent, right? <laughs> and that's a fact. Every criminal does it, right? And this is the mindset we give ourselves. So we do poor me, poor me, poor me. And then, you know, the light bulb went on and thought, hold on. So the police stitched me up. What did I expect was going to happen? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Look, I've been doing them for years. I had them yeah. running around in circles while they're sitting outside my ass, eating sandwiches and drinking cold coffee, looking at beautiful ass, beautiful cars, yeah. beautiful women walking out of there, going to lovely restaurants and eating for all these years and yeah. years and years. And Could I expect any I less? What, you know what, what the fuck? Come on. Why, why, Do you know what, what I mean? It so, me. I remember a bank. Fair play. It's the game. I, I was on a bank fraud trial. I tell you what, it was exactly September 1985. <clears throat> and I basically set up 10, 10 accounts in Barclays Bank, cross hit the checks, and I took them for about 100 grand. It was a lot of money then, right? And I went to court with two defendants. And I, me and my barrister, we just, we had the jury laughing, you know, we were quite, we were quite a good team together. And I walked out after not guilty, right? And the cop, one of the cops came over to me, detective superintendent. And he said, you were lucky there, right? Don't think you, your luck ain't got away. I went, let me tell you, I said, Barclays and all the other banks earmark 0.5 of 1% on the interest rate to cover all thefts that they know is going to happen before it happened. So it was my duty to take the money. Because if I didn't take it, Barclays would have kept it. And he went, <laughs> right, with that attitude, you, you know, that's, that's it, mate. We, mm. You know, he really had the um. But it was actually true what I was saying. Not surprising. No, but it was actually <laughs> true, though, what I was saying. You know, they knew you were going to take the money before you took it. Yeah. So you had to take it. That's the point I was making. Anyway. Yeah, I know. I don't think it went down too well. Though, <laughs> no, it wouldn't have done. No. <laughs> when these look back and you talk about your life and stuff, does it still bring back emotion and memories where you think, fuck me, look what I read? Not anymore. Nah. It's a long time ago now, isn't it? My, my <clears throat> particular crime was 30 years ago. I'm happy with my life. What's it seem when you say you get rooms full of money? Like how much money was counted out at some stages? Hundreds of millions. How did you lose that cash, Steve? No, it wasn't mine, was it? It was Colombians no, no. and... How did it... Like, I'm just trying to get my head round, because, I mean, I had bags that contained, like, 200 grand or 150 yeah. grand in, not rooms full of money. No, right? we had rooms full I, of money. I admit that. But I had troubles with a quarter of a mil in this country. It's Losing it. a quarter of a million pound in cash. I told you, in the end, I used to keep it over abroad, get paid in Amsterdam, go down to Antwerp, uh, get paid in Amsterdam, buy diamonds, trade them in Antwerp for checks, and then put the checks in. That's the only way I could do it. Mm -hmm. And um, lo losing cash in this country is very difficult, Steve, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. In these days, you know, like back in the 70s or yeah, the early 80s. Now I think chance. it's nearly impossible. It's nearly impossible, yeah. mate. Mm -hmm. well, once they're looking at you and they've got all the details of, of everything that you've <sighs> ever done, unless you're digging big holes. I go, I go, go to a news agents with a, get a tenner out of my pocket and they're all looking. Everything's on plastic these days. Yeah. You know, my whole life revolves around my debit card. Seriously. And um, See, because this knows how you lose roomfuls of money. That must have been so difficult. It, back then it wasn't. It was easy, wasn't it? You could buy anything. Uh, when we, how far are we going back to? Uh, 96. 96. The last yeah. time. No, you I know you've done well. Started in the early 80s, 90s. Yeah. So it was easy in there. Nobody asked so me like any questions. Thatcher really put the brakes on. I remember going into my bank manager's office. It was around about 1987. And he said, the days are gone, Sid, when you can walk into yeah. this bank with 20 grand in a bag. I went, what? He went, here's the new legislation, mate. Yeah. And that, I that's you, that the was thing about 87. Yeah. 
Thatcher well, put it out. We had, we had a problem in, in Holland when we was, was changing money and the people used to take it to Belgium. Yeah. And on one point, they That's took what I used to 900 grand. The week before, they took about the same and they got exchanged into Gilders. Yeah. And then this following week, they took 900 grand and just said, they shut the bank, yeah. shut the doors, locked them in, and the police came and took them away. Yeah. The week before, they weren't doing anything about it. No, there you go. What's the biggest problem you have when you've got millions and millions of pounds in a, a house? Keeping the, keeping it safe. <laughs> you know, once we was taking it to there, uh, there was people at the doors with machine guns. Colombians, born killers, just stood there protecting that money with their lives. Oh, we've thrown them into over, in, over there? In Amsterdam, yeah. Oh, in Amsterdam? Yeah. Yeah. Things so. have changed now. I said George Reeves on, he was, he put his money in Switzerland, but he had the check, 15 million, but he got a pulp with the coppers, ate mm. the check, and that was it, the money was going. Yeah. 15 mil. Yeah, I'll tell you <laughs> what, the, I, I, when, I, when I was active, the people that actually edited the, the, the group that I was, uh, the, the coat was coming from in, in Amsterdam, the ones that you never see, right? I said, uh, Switzerland, and through their intermediary, he went to me, forget about Switzerland. And you know what? Three months later, the FBI went in there and started turning over banks in Switzerland. They knew three months before. So they'd obviously been tipped off by their uh, suppliers, you know, from South America. Obviously, when you're active, you get away with so much. But when you get caught, it's a case of, ah, fuck, man, I made a mistake there. But you're always going to be caught in the, in the long run, well, like I say, there is a few who never get caught, but most of their cop uh, politicians, really. Yeah. But they're the big criminals and the top of the police force. And <laughs> we all know in Holland, they had a case that was running, it's called the ERT affair, where it was, it was bringing in 22,000 kilos of cocaine every month. And the money was all over the place. It was mixed in with loads of gangs, but none of them got caught. That's a the lot politicians. of money in one yeah. month, on it? 22 and tons. You, you've got to think, where, where'd all this crimes come from? Phenomenal. You, you think of the biggest criminals, for me, the biggest criminals in this country is the royal family. They, they, <laughs> they started with, with heroin. They run for 100 years with the yeah, heroin the wars. War, the opium opium wars. wars in 1840. Yeah. You know, That's after they've had all the years of slavery yeah. where they've earned hundreds of millions and, you know, the, the whole thing. And when the Chinese said, you're poisoning our nation, you're poisoning our people, do you know what the British done? They sent a gunboat, the yeah. first steam-driven gunboat it was yeah. in those days, right, up the Yangtze River and, and blew them up. Biggest drug dealers in history, British government. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Okay. We've only learned from them. Mm -hmm. you know, I, yeah. I didn't wake up one morning and realise that cocaine was a drug that I'd invented and started importing. That had already been going on for 100 years Yeah. by, by the state and the royal well, family. Britain, you know. The Queen Victoria was an opium <clears throat> addict. Yeah. Did right. they, uh, the heroin not start World War One. We were not giving it to the kids in America. Well, yeah, as well. Mm -hmm. Well, heroin. 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 Yeah. No, no, that was the dance of uh, trade, uh, not trade treaties, arms treaties, when it was, uh, yeah. we, like, we guaranteed Russia if they got in a row, and it started with Mario Princip shooting the Grand Duke, didn't it? Yeah. Russia got in a row and that drew us in the row and it escalated. Um, I don't, not to my knowledge, it was anything to do with heroin. If you, if you think about the biggest landowner in this country, the Duke of Westminster, yeah. he had what, how many, 9,000 opium dens in London? Grosvenor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah all round Limehouse way, yeah, yeah. most of them. Yeah. So we're, we're just uh, runoffs from, from, from them, really. How much corruption is involved with? The drug game? No, it's completely corrupt from <coughs> top to bottom. Yeah, I, I weren't top to, bottom. to know, to be honest with yeah. you. I, I didn't know any. I just moved the stuff and my people over in Amsterdam told me certain things, but they never, ever once mentioned that there was politicians involved in it. Um, you know, further up the scale. Mm -hmm. Well, you've now got politicians dealing in cannabis, haven't you? So well, when you've got an industry, they, they reckon the total drug industry, right, is estimated to be $500 billion per annum worldwide. That's the total drug industry. Now, look, you're not going to have a kitty that's 500 billion strong without people at the top getting their, their beaks wet. No. It's impossible, right? If you said to me, oh, the total drug industry is worth 50 billion, all right, okay, then maybe it may not be. 500 billion, half a trillion dollars. They're in it up to their necks, mate. 
They must be. It's too think, big. Think of the police as well, you know, seeing all that cash. It's too big. Customs, seeing all that cash. It's got to hit some of them, hasn't it? They're thinking, bastard. Why aren't we like that? Well, the CIA got caught, if you remember. Yeah, the CIA is always right? caught. I mean, it, you know, for, for once, they, they got caught with their trousers down. But they must have been involved in it for years and probably still are to a certain degree. They got pulled in with Noriega, didn't they? It turned out they were dealing in coke alongside him. Yeah. And, and sometimes money that comes from dishonesty like that, right? It's like there's, like there's a saying, right? Nothing grows in disinfectant. Right? When you clean something up that much, right, you need a bit of dirt for things to grow. Right? And it was like when they cleaned up the, the cocaine situation in Miami. All the building trade collapsed. Right? It's, like, it's not as easy. It's this, this business we're talking about is not as straightforward. It's not a slam dunk. Right? It's a very grey area. Do you think drugs will be legalised, Andrew? I think in reality... <clears throat> Governments that we have now say punishment because voters believe what they say and they say punish, punish, punish. In reality, some drugs could be legalised. You know, I think yeah. herbal cannabis should be legalised because the reason why cannabis, people haven't understood the elements of the cure and healing elements of cannabis because it's a natural plant and you cannot trademark anything which is a natural natural from the earth. You can trademark chemicals that are made into tablets, aspirins and all the other bits and pieces. So if you now start to legalise marijuana and it's commonly and easily available, it allows people to start yeah, to do tests on it, okay? Look at the natural healing elements there are in it. And I think then you can have a different a change in pattern completely. Yeah. I think educating, legalized, like yeah. Mara, educating Rama, people to music now. James, yeah. you know, people most drugs can be used. Most drugs were used. Ecstasy was used during the war. You know, the German troops were given it so they'd keep war, won't be hungry. It would throw, <laughs> throw morale for the soldiers. So most of these drugs do start off on a path, which is actually for some sort of general good intention, whether it's meditation or whatever it can be. And some of these drugs do actually heal stuff, like, you know, there's potential talk of, you know, Parkinson's disease being, you well, know, look at cannabis works. Right and cannabis stuff works, like this. Yeah. So I think it won't happen now. It, I it? think marijuana could become legalised in my lifetime. Um, it's slowly creeping that way. Yeah. Don't think the class you've A got, drugs If you've like got caught on the street with a handful of marijuana or, now, you're or, not going to go to cocaine cold. will. Because too much political pressure, there's too many votes, mm -hmm. you know. Here's the bad guy. More prisons, <clears> more police on the street. You know, give us your vote. It's one of them ones, isn't it? Yeah. Let's yeah, it's, thing, quite, yeah. it's, it's hard to win elections when you go on a low crime rate thing. When, when you say we're going to be easy on crime or we're going to delegalise, it's a bad, It's not a vote getter. A vote getter, sadly, is bang them up. That's what the vote getter is. And as far as marijuana is concerned, virtually in this country, it's been decriminalised. Yeah, there's people around my way I know that have been caught with two or three lights growing their own plants. And up to about four lights, you get a caution, they take the goods away. They don't even go to court. <laughs> yeah, you've got to try and legalise it. I mean, it's illegal in America. How many states? Steve, loads, now? loads. Like, but loads it's, of it's coming here as well. The, the, the first marker you've got to look at is that when the, the Theresa May's husband started dealing in cannabis, right? Theresa yeah. May, when she was Prime Minister, yeah. her husband bought. Tate and Lyle Sugar Company and changed it into cannabis. They sell 100,000 kilos a year. And he, he was married to the ex-Prime Minister. Yeah, it's down here in London. Is it? Yeah, that, that's our introduction into the well, government. Well, they grow cannabis legally for the, for the cannabis oils and all the stuff well, they sell in chemists. There's a, there's a spray that you can get for Parkinson's yeah. called yeah. Sativax. Yeah, that's 50% yeah. CBD, 50% THC. Yeah. That is sold by the company that was owned by Theresa May's husband. Oh, fair enough, I didn't know that. So, uh, and he, he literally turned Tate and Lyle sugar producing company. Yeah. He bought the, the same greenhouse space as 55 football pitches. Yeah. In B Billington, is it? In London? Could it get up for Cannon Town, Silver Town? Somewhere Silver there. Yeah. Yeah. Not and Billington. And not Billington. He's, he's dealing it in over 100,000 kilo of cannabis a year. Oh, he's I sold the, it now. I know the Tate and Lyle factories on the old Fall Road. Yeah, it's all greenhouses, isn't it? Silver Town, back to yeah. Silver Town. Yeah. There was one down the old So Fall really, Road. what the government's yeah. saying there is, is just get ready. So I think yeah. people should But I think when we talk about drugs and about legalisation there, really, you've got to park... 
cannabis up to one side of it because it's such a it's so different. You know, that, yeah. if we talk about when you talk about the legalization of drugs, the main ones you're really referring to are smack and uh, crack mm -hmm. and uh, cocaine and heroin. We're a long way off in that. In that yeah, that, yeah, that. We're, that, that, they're yeah. the two main stages. You know, the others are all on the periphery. Yeah. MDMA and that sort of thing. Let's talk about the positive stuff that you guys. It's been a positive chat anyway. It's been educational yeah. for people. Like I, I believe these conversations <laughs> will be watched 20, 30, 40 years down the line because of the knowledge that's in it. I had a guy on who was, who was in the CIA, and the CIA hire prisoners to work with the CIA to teach them things that yeah. they don't know but yeah. well, use men are should clearly be doing. intelligent to yeah. be at that craft it's just because you end up <clears> in prison people think ah that's a stupid way to go but to be at that level they've got to be some level of genius and methods I think and to create that whatever you've fucking done but the stuff that you're doing now Stephen the painting stuff like how do people get involved what's your social medias like what's the plans for the future at the moment the only thing I've been doing for the last three months is setting up my own uh, e-commerce site for all my paintings, all my prints. I've got hundreds of, uh, I've got 20 odd, 30 years of, of paintings that I'm turning into uh, t shirts, sweatshirts, all that. It's, it's all I do all the time. You had an exhibition, I'm, Steve? Yeah, I've had a few asking. exhibitions, yeah. Have, yeah. I'm not going to be doing any more at the mind. moment, but we well, just concentrate, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So all my stuff's on Steve and me art. You know, it's all going to be coming up. We've got the lad back. It's better than the Craig's men's efforts, I bet. It? Yeah, it's proper art. It's <laughs> yeah, proper painting. Proper art, you know, I can spend no, six listen, months on a painting. I remember you at Loud and Grand getting your curses and that. I know how good you are, mate. Yeah. I know how good you are. But yeah. that, that's my target, is just to, to improve that. And then once I'm in a, 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 a little bit safer, because financially I'm not safe. I just work and, and live and do what I do. I've got no vast amounts of money. But as soon as I get into a reasonable position, I'm going to do what Andrew does. I'm going to start using the art to, to show people that there's a different way, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not just all about crime and money. It's all about living and, and painting something, something or doing something. It doesn't have to be painting. it. something that you feel good about. I don't remember ever thinking one day I felt good when I smuggled fucking 1,000 kilo of cocaine. I never felt good. There might have been some weird thing in the background, but I never thought, like now when I finish a painting that I've worked on for six months, I can sit and look at it for three months thinking how good it is, mm -hmm. even though I've done it myself. You know what I mean? I'm not bragging that I'm doing it. It's just that there's pride there about something that I've done. Yeah. Well, no, I don't think there was, there was ever pride involved. in the crime side of it. It was just something we did and yeah. got out of the way to get on with the but rest of your involved, life. To be involved in the arts to your level, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of culture, isn't it? Yeah. Peace of uh, mind. Culture instead of crime. Peace of mind, completely, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, w I wish I didn't have to do all this computer stuff and could get back to doing my own mm -hmm. actual paintings with oil and canvas, but, yeah. you know, there's nobody else can do it for me because it's mm -hmm. me who's got to explain why I did them paintings and this, you know, I've got my nephews working with me. But you you, you work know, the with old painting now, don't you? Yeah, all the yeah. time, yeah. Yeah, that's it, yeah. No, What's no, your no, social media separate. platforms on that, Stephen, as well, for people to give you a follow and Just follow yeah. Stephen me out. Mm -hmm. I'm on YouTube. I'm do, doing YouTube, oh, teaching people. Stuff, yeah. mm -hmm. But, yeah, Stephen me out is, is where everything is, Stephen, uh, Stephen me at dot com. Mm -hmm. How about really, yourself, Andrew? I know you're doing big things at the moment as well. Yeah, we're gradually moving forward. Um, Maximus has funded us now, basically, to deliver courses. So anyone that's um, unemployed, part of the restart scheme, they go to any job centre. Uh, we, One of my companies, White Rhino, we do a whole cohort of media courses from how to make films on your mobile phone, film editing, you know, all the various stuff, podcasting. Uh, people can sign up, so that's absolutely free. Um, the government pays for that for them. Uh, we've also got an tra uh, association with Training360. We've got a large cohort of training courses in construction industry that which leads to jobs and employment, same remit, and also the foundation does uh, mentoring courses. Uh, we've just started a house and association, um, which we look like we're going to get a huge investment in from private fund to start that. Um, also, I think this year I'm going to be looking at probably getting a film series off the grid brand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, a few okay. things happening. Amazing, brother. What about yourself, Sidney? What's your plans? Um, immediate plans for this year is I want to write a second book. Um, Plug your first one. A, Plug your first one. That's the first one, yeah. That one there. So the name of it, I, it wasn't called that originally. But it was the American Publishing Company told me to call it that. Um, it was, it was under. Is that my copy, Sid? 
<laughs> no, I, I, honestly, this is, I tried to get they a copy of this back to Dave. Oh, all right. I'll tell I you why. I see Mark, <laughs> <laughs> I had to, I had to, uh, I tried to get a copy myself because I, I use it as a reference for when I'm writing my new book. And believe it or not, I couldn't get one. Right. And um, the publishers are sold out, sold a lot of copies in America. Um, but anyway, I'm going to write the follow-up book to it. I'm over to, I'm going over to Tenerife in March. Now I'm, I can legally go abroad um, after February. Probably have a month over there or something. Um, but hopefully write this, write the second book before I go. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, that's, that's my immediate, anything long, long term and that, like these two, I haven't got plans like these two have got. How are you going to feel? Cause I've, I, with the last podcast that you always get out, but you always get sucked back in, always out, always yeah. sucked back in. Yeah, no, no, that's over the first yeah, time I'm you'll be, admitted, at, yeah. the first time you'll be away. Like, yeah, yeah, but you see, it comes, it comes down, we're back to it again. It comes down to age. If I was sitting here after what, what has happened and I was 35, 36, 37, I'd say, fucking bollocks, let's have another go. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I would. That'd be my attitude. That would be yeah. my attitude, right? Yeah. But my age now, yeah. come on. Suddenly you're going from being doing something that's maybe considered slightly heroic to a joke. Like you mentioned a bloke just now, 74, he's still doing 15 in jail. I mean, you become a joke, yeah. right? It's not anything, you do certain things or whatever when you're in the, in the right uh, age frame, right? But come on, people our age, not so much you, you're a bit younger, right? <laughs> you, you've still got another 15 left in you. <laughs> you've got another run in you, Andrew, that's what he's saying. He's got the pilot license. Right? He's got another, he's he's got got another set of That's the walking around the edge. You know what I'm saying, you know what I'm coming back to. Me and Steve, roughly the same age, come on, mate, you've got to be kidding, yeah, you know. No chance. You sit there with your grandchildren, like Steve does, like I do, right? You know, probably within five or six years, I'll be a great grandfather. To be involved in, in, in smuggling at that age, it's just not on, is it? Yeah. You For know? anybody watching, guys, Stephen, you first, that's maybe in a struggle in life right now, like, what advice would you have for them? Just pick something you, you like doing. The, the, the problem with people like us is that we, we, we get uh, distracted quickly. Uh, we see something, we think we can do it, and we follow it through. Stop doing it. You know, it's hard to say when you when you're young. You know, you know, you, everything looks easy, doesn't it? Until you, you you end up with, like we've all ended up with, with massive sentences. Twenty four. Nothing years. really to show for it. You got yeah. thirty. I've got twenty four. So, yeah. um, Nothing to show for it. it. It's uh, it's even harder these days. Like like we've been saying about the technology and what have you. It's only a matter of time with, with the systems yeah. that they've got. Especially like that Encro thing. No doubt about it. That that was a shock to me because I, I heard that about it when I was uh, when I was out the Encro where they they started doing the the encryption and things like that and everybody thought they were safe but all of a sudden they weren't safe anymore. You know, and there's another thing just before we go. It's amazing that Encro thing, isn't it? When you think about it, the police have concentrated on catching the drug dealers. Right, they've got tens of thousands of paedophiles that they've not even looked at yet but they chose to go straight to the drug yeah. dealers don't they yeah i'll tell you, what, you know, one interesting point you made a good point there steve one interesting point is it was about 20 years ago they did a hard focus on pedophile they set up a false uh, account that had pedophile images and all the rest of it on right and 15 no 1250 people that went to it and paid by their own barclay cards right 800 went to court, right, out of 1,200. Who were the other 400? I'll tell you who they were. They were fucking judges, ministers and all that. All that got prosecuted was the common man. Yeah, as always. Mm -hmm. Right? But the mysterious 400, I mean, it was like, it was all swept under the carpet. Even the newspapers never reported on it. Yeah. Right? What about yourself, Andrew? Like, for anybody that's watching, you're, through that, you're in that life, you're out it now, you're doing well, but... For anybody that's maybe in a life of crime, what advice would you have for them? Say this, if you can get out before the wall falls off, as I said, you know, <laughs> stopping out and saying being stopped. And if someone is walking out of prison, you know, I was walking out of prison not so long ago, given £46 pound, uh, discharge um, grant <laughs> and a train ticket. And <laughs> in the space of time from now, we're building one of the fastest growing rehabilitation charities in the country. So what I'm saying is you could do anything. You know, 
and you haven't got to have experience in what you're doing or background in doing it. I had no, you know, real knowledge or background in doing what I do now, but I had the ambition and the drive to want to do it, and I felt good about doing it. You need money it. to do it, though. Mm-hmm. Sorry? Do you need money to do it, what you're doing now? Well, no, because money will come like anything else, you know. Okay, like, every sector, well, like every sector, you know, it's what graft you put into it. I didn't yeah. want to go out there with a cap in hand and have a charity. I knew that the way it could work was be offering services to, you know, to the prison service, yeah. to the government that they need, you know. And they're multi-million pound contracts. Do you know what I mean, James? Mm-hmm. So. It, we've done it unconventionally, not by going and saying, please give me your money and put it in a hat. People are having hard times and I'm realistic about <clears> it. <throat> but if you've got a gaping hole in a system which needs help, do you know what I mean? We've got the power of the people and the services to obviously plug that hole. Mm-hmm. So that's called a business. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, good for you. Like anything, yeah, you right. know, give it a punt. Yourself, yeah. Sydney, you've had that, you've battled with addiction as well you've changed that like for anybody that's maybe stuck in an addiction lifestyle just now what advice would you have for them the, the only the only thing you can say is, and obviously my you know my heart goes out i don't i'm not the type of person who looks down on addicts there's a lot of people that our society generally looks down on people really you're just a victim of circumstance and um the only thing i would say to them is and it may sound a bit corny and it may maybe old hat but try and get back to a normal rhythm of life you know not the because what their lives are is, is getting up in the morning, sorting out drugs to get off their nut in the evening. That's what it's all about. It's their day, the, the whole cycle. They've got to break the, try and break the cycle, do things like go to the gym, go to the saunas as well. Like I told you, I sweated cracking that out of my system in, in seven days, right? Of, of sweating it in the gym, working hard on the punch bag, going in the sauna, sweating it out, get that shit out of the system. And then, because when the shit's in your system, you can give them all the advice you, you, you want, but their brain's not geared to take it. Get the stuff out of your system, and then you will start receiving, um, you start thinking the proper thoughts. Hmm. You know, that's what I would say to them. Lads, listen, for coming on today and giving me your time, I very much I appreciate James. that. Think highly of the three of you. Yeah, well done, James. For what you've done in the past to what you are doing now. Like, these discussions, I believe, will be watched all around <sighs> the world because of the knowledge that's in them. Like, that's ain't here glorifying it. Listen, we can all have a laugh. We've got to laugh about the fucking mad shit because yeah. it's fucked up. Yeah, fuck yeah, you got it. Like, yeah, got, yeah. yeah but close. for people watching, we're not here to glorify, we're here to try and educate. Yeah. And you yeah. three have can clearly do that you've lived the life you've done it and now you're making the changes to better your life to enjoy your grandkids your great grandkids like this is what it's well, all about I'm the great grandkids he's grandkids he's, he's, he's grandkids, still just granddad yeah, yeah. at the moment but, yeah. would you like to finish up on anything granddad. Yeah. 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 granddad would you like to finish up you're on anything you're on the way now probably aren't you? yeah just possible for people it's like you know he's doing different things mm-hmm. Sid could do the same thing about drug rehabilitation I'm going to use my art to, to show people how to rehabilitate, you know, and think it. Andrew's sh- showing different things. I'm going to learn off Andrew because mm-hmm. he's doing it the yeah, right no, way. No, he's doing that. it through the, through the government. You know, that's what we need. We need, we need the, to stop this thing about people, criminals and government being two completely independent things. They're not. It's all part of one but thing one of the troubles society. You, you, oh, listen, I appreciate everything you say. But one of the problems you've got with governments is the transitional you could be dealing with a certain yeah, home secretary. there five years, I mean, especially the Tories. We've had three prime ministers in, um, what, four months? Yeah. Um, you know, listen, I've got nothing but respect for the pair of you and what you're setting out to do. But it, to say, people in the power is very transitional. And um, just hope it goes well for you. I hope you get a Labour government. Yeah. Right, because the Tories, you won't get much out of the Tories, I would have thought. Well, I don't know. Um, Andrew's getting a bit out of them, are you? He's trying. Uh, well... I, you know, I, you know, yeah, if you come up with a plan like he's done and like I'm trying to do, mm-hmm. yeah. I think once you put it in the face, they find it very hard to say no. Yeah, it's all about keep yeah. knocking at the door and eventually it'll keep knocking. It's, it's a yeah. society problem. But then, then you, you, may well, you may well end up in a situation where you get papers like the Daily Mail, oh, look what they're spending on these bleeding old legs. And you're all, always going like, to get that, mate. Yeah, you'll you'll, you'll get, get mud thrown at you. Yeah. It's not something I'm already not accustomed to having mud thrown <laughs> in the newspapers. And the reality of it is, look, you know, we're we're, we're fair game for that, you know. Yeah, so whatever comes, comes, do yeah. you know what I mean? Mm. But it's more important, as I said, that you lay a legacy project down that actually changes lives. So on that note, what yeah. I'm doing next, 
Um, all the things you're doing are great. And what do I tell young people? I'm going to start building my own social medias now because I'm limited with the foundation because obviously it is a lot of red tape and mm -hmm. I perhaps can't express some of the things I'd like to express. But I'm going to build my own social medias and try to bring some, you know, entrepreneurial skills to young people, which are going to be free. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm going to teach them to take them through the steps to set up their own businesses and actually have a crack at it. Because if yeah. you're going to sell drugs, you're going to go on that path, get them in prison or dead. Do yeah. you know what I mean? If you want to take it, different products, I'll show you how to do that and I'll show you how to make some money out of it mm -hmm. and probably lay down legacy projects yourself in five or ten years. Yeah. So that's what I can do, James, yeah. do you know what I mean? But the main yeah. thing is he's a trying. The main thing is he's a free go for it, and he's mate. a trying. Go Nobody go can stop it. you from doing anything, go achieving go for anything it. in this yeah. life. It's all down to the individual. We can change the game, can change science, yeah. can change beliefs, can change the governments. Anything is got as long as you fucking believe yeah. that up here and nobody can tell you otherwise. Would you like yeah. to finish up on anything, lads? Yeah, go out and buy this. Pill. <laughs> <laughs> I <love that> this <laughs> time. <laughs> the last one in Gangster. But listen, oh, guys, okay. again, thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. This is the first of the, the, the round table. No, it's not enjoyed it, yeah.